All right, so we're going to talk about uh, scaling. I want to have this nice little interlude here. If you can see this, there's sound probably. Ha ha. So my, <laughs> that's just weird. So my, uh, <laughs> if you go to Farrell, you'll see like, oh, I've got to get that bubble out. Um, can I iron this out? So my uh, daughter Charlotte came in and we uh, put that up last night. So there are uh, all sorts of little funny thematic de decals now in Farrell Hall. <coughs> oh, and this is where we are now. All right, well, Pratchett helped. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. He's, he's being a nuisance there, obviously. Uh, best kind of nuisance. All right, scaling. Okay, so this is a whole uh, big section here. As you can see, we're going to go through uh, a bunch of things. Um, <coughs> lots of systems have scaling in them. Certainly won't get through all this today, but it's going to we're going to talk about allometric scaling just to start with, just this concept. And then this sort of ranging through a whole bunch of uh, um, uh, fields. And you know, some may be more than others. This will be about Lego sets at the end uh, and ant colonies and organizations. All right. OK, Pratchett, good work. This is really important, obviously. So uh, scaling. Huge. So I could do this all day. Um, <laughs> right. I, I showed it to Charlotte and she's like, <gasps> I said, uh, you know, it only took 400,000 goes. <laughs> All right, so lots of comp many, many complex systems, especially when they, they cross many scales usually. Not always, but they can cross many scales, right? So, I mean, we could have, s usually there's a micro and macro aspect, right? So you've got the individual interacting parts and there's some global thing, but you can certainly have many, many scales. So this is a, this is a thread uh, through lots of different um, fields and, and systems. Uh, this, there'll be a second piece after this, which will be a, more specifically about power law size distributions, which is the probability, for example, you know, if you randomly select a person from the US, how much wealth do they have, right? What's that like? Like very rarely will you get Bill Gates. Or is it Bezos is number one, right? Uh, so, so, and it's like earthquakes, for example, right? So most of the time not much happens and then occasionally, you know, bigger things and then occasionally much bigger things. But that's the next piece. So we're going to talk about scaling. It's usually about how uh, aspects of a system relate. Right. Hmm. Okay. So basic things, uh, and then I in the next course we're going to we will do other things. There, there, are, there is a lot of arguing about how you <laughs> measure these exponents or these these relationships. It's quite crazy. Hundred years of madness, uh, and then there's some nice pieces in here about branching networks and uh, I'll touch on this. So I know we've had right one person in complex networks who usually go the other way around, but I have a long piece in there about um, scaling in biology. So we'll just touch on that. So usually this is a very simple thing. This is it. So here's our first equation. Y equals <laughs> some constant times x to the alpha. So we have get the right terms sorted out. So we'll talk about a scaling exponent or just an exponent. Right, these are the, this is the language. Uh, this can be any number, of course. So if it's uh, negative, then we've got some decay. Positive, we've got some um, growth in some way. Uh, if it's one, then you'll have what we'll call isometry. And if it's not one, then there's some allometric kind of aspect. Depends what we're doing. All right. So this can matter a lot, the prefactor. Uh, this is often, and we'll get back to that with the uh, Buckingham Pi theorem, which is a beautiful piece. Uh, it will have to carry, and that's what the... Next piece here, we'll have to carry uh, dimensions, right? So this is a really important aspect of equations. So it's okay, I can move forward. So it must balance dimensions. So this is an important thing, we'll come back to it. So imagine we've got some uh, set of objects where the length of them in some, you know, measured in some way, we measure we've got length, breadth, and, and height, say, length, width, and height. You know, we've got a bunch of boxes at UPS, and they scale allometrically, they're not the same, right? So this, 
This would be, this is volume, this would be V to the one third if there were just a bunch of boxes. They don't have to be cubes, right? If they were just rectangular boxes that when you scale them up <coughs> uniformly in every dimension, they all look the same. But if you have to scale one dimension in a slightly faster way or slower way and consequently true in the others, then this exponent will start to move away from, has to be different to a third. Does this make sense? So it's a little slow. So you can imagine a set of uh, trees, for example, right? So you've got all these trees, and because of the way gravity works, it's not I'm not saying this is the way trees work, we've got all these trees, we'll have a picture of it, uh, whether if we line them all up and then we try to just like, you, you know, just with a with like a pinch, right, on a, on a phone or whatever, we're just going to shrink them and then match them up. Then we see that the, you know, once we've got them all with the same height, right, we've got these big sequoias, and then we're shrinking them down and matching them all up then they don't have the same widths, right? They're not isometrically the same. They're not just zoomed in or zoomed out photos of each other. So this, when that's true, when they're not just zoomed in or zoomed out, then, th then we talk about al allometry. And I have that in the next few slides. All right, so this is just an example. So this is just a convention here. We'll put these sort of uh, square brackets around and we'll say this is the dimensions of this, this prefactor C, right? So it's gonna be the dimensions of L, divided by the dimensions of volume to a quarter. This is a length scale, so that's what this means. It's a length. This is, uh, volume is L cubed, so it's L cubed to the fourth, and so this is L to the fourth. So this, this, this carries something, right? So if this was in feet, and this is feet cubed to the power of a quarter, then this is, has to have a, a feet to the quarter sitting in there. Fair enough? Just, just want to make sure that's there, because you will see in a lot of things, and we'll start to do this, you put a little tilde here and get carried away and just ignore that and just say they're kind of the same. Physicists do bad things <laughs> with backs of envelopes, which are a prehistoric technology, but um, I will still refer to them. All right, so that's just a good thing to just kind of have there, right? So the Buckingham Pi theorem is coming. That's a great thing. Okay, uh, so very simple thing in log-log space. Uh, these relationships are linear, right? So basic properties of logs, we'll take some base B here, just log of the left-hand side, log of the right-hand side. Uh, this is our prefactor, I'll put it over here. Uh, log of a product is the sum of the logs, and then log of X, the alpha, we bring the power down the front. So now we've got log of X and log of Y, and this is uh, a, a just a prefactor here, alpha's become a prefactor. So this is just a simple MX plus C kind of thing. So that seems good. So if we have some power law, whatever it is, x cubed, x3, and we take logs of, the, of the, the data, then we'd like to see that stack up on a straight line. So it's going to actually be a lot of straight, you know, measuring, doing regression on straight lines. So you'd think that shouldn't be too hard. Scientists should be able to work that out. It turns out there are, there are many ways to do regression. Um, and there's actually one good way. There's actually only one way that doesn't... Uh, uh, involve the, the dimensions, right? So X and Y, right? This could be money and happiness. They're measured in different ways. Uh, so there's only one that, that sort of deals with that properly. Or I should say, it doesn't matter if you change um, units, right? Right. Okay, so there's a lot of messing around, as I said, with, with looking for straight lines on these double logarithmic plots or log log plots. People just sort of say this. Now, we're humans, we've got the 10 thing going on. This is just what happened. We talk about log 10. I know if you're a pure math person and you want natural logs, that's fine. But um, it's, it's just, this is uh, being good social humans, right? This is what lots of people have done over time and we've kind of just got in our heads. So when we talk about, uh, yes, the dozen loss, would, it would be better, but we have failed them. Um, so aliens will appear and say, what are you doing? It's gonna happen. These idiots use 10. Um, <laughs> I mean, there'll be other things they'll laugh at, but um, anyway, but hands, right? And social pressure. So we're, we're, we're on the 10 thing. The French kind of won this one, but uh, uh, 12, 12 really would be good. Or whatever, 60, you know. Sumerians, I think they're into 60s. Okay, so, okay. But this is what we're going to do. And you have to label it. You have to put log 10. I'm just going to say this. You see papers and they don't, and you're like, what is going on? That's not right, right? Be good people. So this is being good people. Um, so it's possible that this is an accident. The hands thing, the whole 10 digits business is an accident of history. Um, but that's debated. There are some efforts to explain that it makes sense from a 
growing, things growing on the ends of arms point of view. Josh Bongard, I guess, is going to sort that out for us. But it does feel a little whatever. And of course, when we make aliens for, you know, TV or whatever, they usually have different numbers of digits. And the Simpsons, right? Just three plus one, yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. So we're going to talk about orders of, mag orders of magnitude means powers of 10, right? Carl Sagan put this into a whole generation, but that's a long time ago. All right, fine. Okay, so let's go for a nice example. Uh, we'll get to koalas in a little bit, which is going to be very enjoyable. But this is a pretty spectacular scaling law. This is great. And so this is most of what we'll focus on are sort of positive exponent things, right, where some aspect of the system or a collection of entities, right, in a system. And here we've got all of, you know, life we're sort of talking about in this first part. Uh, these, are, these are about our brains, right? So brains have gray matter and white matter. This is sort of this broad distinction. The gray are the thinky bits, and the white is the connecty bits, right? Okay. I think this is the technical terms. And <laughs> it turns out we, we're pretty special, right? We think we're pretty special. But we're actually, we, in terms of this architecture, we, we fit on this line. So this is log 10 of gray matter, right? Thinky bits. And then log 10 of um, the, the white matter on this scale. So what's the big deal about this? First of all, fantastic. You know, this is not scattered all over the place. There's great agreement. And uh, this exponent, so if we measure, right, you do a regression on this thing, you get an exponent that, in this case, is about 1.23. So this is a superlinear scaling, right? We'll talk about linear, sublinear, and superlinear. So it's a superlinear scaling. So that means as these brains, as we go through these organisms, brains get bigger and bigger. Um, and there is a piece, it, I was trying to add a s whole section on uh, relative brain size, and I'll, I'll try to clean that up. That is a very messy business, actually. There's a lot of arguing about what that, how that works. But it is true that as you get bigger organisms, their brains are relatively, they're bigger, but they're relatively smaller. Right. But there's a lot of arguing about what the scaling is for that. Anyway, it turns out if we kind of ignore, you know, the relative, and there's whether you include like lean body mass versus adipose tissue and, you know, all sorts of stuff. All right, so, but this is a great scaling. Great, great scaling. Uh, so this is the correlation coefficient here. It's pretty solid. And this often happens with these regressions, very, you know, small errors. But what we'll see actually really depends on whether you, like, where you do the regression. So you can get into trouble that way. But yeah, computing elements and wiring. So this is uh, from 2000, PNAS paper. And so why is this, right? So why is there this, and why would it be 1.23? So the sort of thing you start to look for, for a lot of scalings, you know, if it's four thirds, that feels like there's some dimension thing going on maybe, you know, we live in three dimensions. You know, so we kind of start to work with twos and threes and fours, simple numbers, uh, because, you know, there's some sense that that might be explained from some sort of simple argument. Uh, but there's some, that's a bit of a funny one. Anyway, so who's on here? So we're pygmy shrews. So these get down to, what is this? This is uh, 10 grams. No, t this is millimeters cubed. I'm sorry. I know that these guys are down about three or four grams. This is volume, of course. This is th three or four grams. They're very small units for the smallest mammals. Um, but yeah, uh, just that's a pretty small brain. Um, <coughs> but it's running a shrew, so it's doing, doing a good job. So lots of interesting things, how, you know, marmosets are in here and so on. You can look through the whole piece. Uh, a sheep got involved, of course. Uh, obviously not the best situation um, for all of these entries into this data set. Uh, slow loris, just a little too slow. We would like to look at your brain. Uh, anyway, so there's an extra piece here, of course, which is these are going to be one example of each species. So you have to think about that. In some plots, because people have lots of rats floating around, they'll have like a whole bunch of rats and then maybe a sheep and a human. So that's a problem with some of the regressions too. But I believe in this case, they've got one example of each one. All right, so why is this? Okay, so we can do a little calculation, simple little calculation. It's a good sort of um, <coughs> back of the envelope kind of thing. And this, this is just working through what they did. And so one can argue about whether this is right or not. So we're going to take, I'll use the notation they had. So gray matter, this is the volume gray matter, white. So we're interested in how these things are related. There's a cortical thickness uh, piece we'll put in. So this is, um, we, you know, we've got this hopefully nice uh, wrinkly brain, right? 
we'll get to someone who doesn't have a very wrinkly brain a little bit, but a uh, nice wrinkly brain, but it has some sort of thickness in that cortex. There's a surface area for that. Uh, and then there's going to be some typical length of these fibers, right? So this is going to be you know, some whole distribution for this. There's some really short ones and then longer ones, but of course there's some limit. Uh, and then this density of these into the uh, interface, right? So I don't know if I should do this, you yeah. know. Oh, maybe it's sad. Right, well, I'll just draw it here. It's okay. So, yeah, we've got some, right, this is our wrinkly brain, and then we've got all these axons coming out. There's some density in there. This is not a, this is a little part of the brain. And, right, so there's some density right, density of, of axons. And I think in this case, we're going to call it P, so it's like a little probability thing. So you can start to put some pieces together. There's, um, first of all, this, right? So, and, and so you can get in trouble here with fractals, right? You can do some bad things. But this is the gray matter. Volume is going to be the surface area of the cortex times its thickness, right? So we've got this thickness here. Uh, and then, yeah, gray matter is going to be this, right? So surface area is this whole piece. So if we flatten it out and made a nice little pancake brain, so this is uh, surf thickness this way, surface area for, the, for all of this, and then G is the volume, right? Which probably happened in iZombie at some point. Okay. Excellent cooking show. So this is the volume of white matter. So we've got all of these wires coming out, and they're going to join up with a, another part of the brain over here. That's kind of the idea, right? So they're going to hit another part of the brain, connecting it together. And of course, some of these are very local. It's a messy business. Uh, so P times S, that's going to give us the total number of uh, um, endpoints of these uh, wires if you like, and then they, they're going to hit both, th they're going to hit this, the cortex twice, so we're going to divide that by uh, two. So now we've got the number of wires, number of axons, and then we're going to multiply them by their average length. And so there's also some you know, width of these things, but this gives you a scaling for the volume of the white matter, right? So this is the number of pieces of spaghetti, and this is the length of the pieces of spaghetti. And we're going to assume that as you go across from your pygmy shrew up to an elephant that the thickness of those axons, I mean, that's what is assumed here. The thickness of the axons doesn't change. And that's sort of a remarkable piece. I mean, apart from just the elements making us all up, right? Elephants and mice and so on were all made out of carbon and hydrogen and so on. The cells are about all about the same size too, right? They don't get bigger. So that next level up, you've got a similar, you've got a mammalian cell, a different mitochondria. All right, and then this is an interesting one. So we're going to say that the, there's some inside this uh, scone, right? You've got some, got your brain here. This is your brain, uh, right? Imagine this is sort of what's going on, right? There's all this wiring across it like this, that there's some typical length scale for these axons, and then the whole volume Right, this is sort of going to be thick enough, perhaps. N this is this is wrinkled enough, like this as well. I guess is the idea, right? Your brain, hopefully, your brain takes up the the cavity here. Not always true. Um, <coughs> this is going to be G is proportional to L cube. So you know you can argue about whether that's right or not. Uh, and then we can do some. So here's the little. So you you speculate about these pieces, or you get them from really you know stronger first principles. And now we're going to just eliminate a couple of things and see, because we want to get how G is scaling with W. So we need to get rid of S and T and, uh, and L. And we'll, we'll leave T because we're a bit worried about that one. So here's a little thing. If you, if you want, you can try to do this, right? It's a very simple thing to do. But you just want to take this equation and replace S, right? So rearrange this, replace S, and then... Uh, rearrange, uh, use this as well here to get rid of G in that, that next equation. Just two steps. So we're going to start with this one, use this, and then use this. It's a little calculation with hands. 
with your paper. to work. Okay. I'll write these down. Right. Right. So the idea is, we'll we're going to take this character here and dump this. Um, right. This is this is s is proportional to g over t. Just turn that around. So now we're going to have w is proportional to a half p. I'm going to stick this in here. So we've got now g over t l, and then we'll stick this g into here. And I know I'm making a nice mess for you. So this is going to be a half p. And the g gets replaced by an l cubed over t times l. So, and the half doesn't matter, right? So now we've got proportional to l uh, to the 4 over t. And I guess I didn't have to do it that way. All right, all right, all right. What we're trying to get to is the uh, g. So let me, let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that. Yep. Got excited. So uh, this, is of course, is uh, l is proportional to g to the third, inverting that thing. So now we have g over t, uh, g to the third. Right. right, so you just mess around with things a little bit until you can get something that looks good. So this is pretty good. This is g to the 1.33, right, divided by t. But we want 1.23, so maybe there's something in the t. And that's, that's in this paper where they just sort of invoke an observation of reality. What happens if the significance eliminates Yeah, so... Going from, and I know this is very rough, this is something we presume is going to be uh, constant across organisms, like the thickness of ab um, axons. Might not be true, right? That might be something that really carries scaling content. So, right, we assume perilously that uh, P scales is, you know, G to the zero is a way to write it, and the uh, thickness of axons scales as um, G to the zero as well. Or, you know, more, more, more truly sort of mass of the, of the entity. Okay. All right, so that's a little, that's a sort of fun little thing to do. So we think that's a little rough. So we got to this. And so this is just then an observation that is invoked in this, uh, just pulled out, you know, cit a citation that thickness of brains tends to grow as the overall brain volume uh, to th this very weak scaling, right? Usually when someone claims there's this kind of scaling, it's a bit, it's a bit sketchy, right? You're a bit worried about this because, you know, you're, you're, measure you're doing a regression, you're just getting this 0.1, you know, maybe you've got zero. Anyway, it, uh, it does the job for us, right? Because it's going to uh, we're going to put a point one, a g to the point one here, and this 1.33 becomes a 1.23. So, of course, it works beautifully. Uh, if you think about this as well, it also shows that uh, surface area of the brain is going to scale as g to the point nine, which is decent, right? So, this is a surface area, and this is a volume. So, this is getting, in terms of like fractal filling, it's getting as close as it, it's getting pretty close to filling. Yeah. That's good. Wrinkly brains. But it depends what your organism has to do, and that's, that's sort of the issue. Okay, so that's, that's a, you know, a, a, a nice thing. It's a beautiful paper. It's a fantastic scaling. So I'm going to uh, hold that up as a banner example. Even there, there's some problems, right? So you can talk about the total volume of the brain, right, in terms of gray, um, gray matter and white matter, and then regress the gray matter and the white matter against it. It looks like they... So this is a bit of an unpleasant aspect that they cope with, is that gray matter seems to scale as some power of this, and white matter does as well. So you have, and it doesn't mean it's really scaling, it's just that, you know, things can look so close. All right. All right, that's another fishy bit there.
Anyway, the upshot is, of course, that measuring exponents is quite messy. All right, so here's a disappointing um, <laughs> aspect for uh, Australian animals. So generally, generally not bad, creature, excellent creatures, right? But uh, this one, the poor old koala, has a very smooth brain. And it also just doesn't take up as much of the cavity that it could. There's just a lot of extra juice flo floating around in there. And uh, this is unfortunate, right? There's a problem with this. George Carlin, who's, you know, it's been a while since George Carlin's been around, but uh, maybe you've come across his stuff. Um, what's wrong with this? I mean, it's funny, got a lot of jokes, but you want to see. All right, the median, right? It should be the median, but that's not going to, it's not going to land quite so well. Um, the median. But we have a lot of trouble, right? Average is a tricky thing. People say this all the time, right? Like half is below the average or whatever. But uh, anyway, uh, median, that's a difficult one. I don't know how we could get to standard deviation as a thing that's reported generally. But I, I guess we're getting, you know, we are, we are doing a better job with data visualization and people are becoming more familiar with looking at things and so on. And there's the whole like training that people might get from like baseball statistics, um, which is not everyone and a diminishing group of people, I think. But anyway, uh, so it should be the median. So you actually, this is an old saying, right? There are various ways of depicting someone's um, not, not quite operating in the full, full way in the head. Paddock is a field, yeah. So they have very small brains relative to their body size, wrinkle-free, and they don't need to do much, right? So they only eat certain kinds of eucalyptus leaves. They don't even drink water. They just eat these leaves. If it rains on them, they just sort of sit there. If you present the leaves to them, they won't eat them. Like, it's just that's beyond the scope of the algorithm. It just doesn't <laughs> work. They just sit in trees. They have to move to the next tree. This is tricky. I've seen this happen. This is hard for them because they keep looking, especially if there's a human nearby, but they'll keep, they keep looking, make sure everything's over, and then scamper across and then eat the next tree. Um, I think they sleep 20 hours a day. It's not great. So they have to have that part of the system running. They have to defend themselves occasionally, and they do have fantastic claws because most of the time they're asleep, so they have to be just locked in. And then now and then they have to make more koalas. But um, really disappointing. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know who has the smallest <laughs> relative. I'm, I'm not sure if they have the absolute smallest, but it's very much down there, and uh, it's smooth. And that's just, that was the, the rough part. Mm. Smooth brain, mm. damn. All right. But as I said, that scaling with uh, body size of overall brain size is actually pretty messy. Um, I guess we know it has to be less than the body, but that's, uh, that's about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> People have made mistakes about that. I'm not kidding. Yeah. I mean, there was a paper in Nature that had the volume of, the, of blood scaling as mass to the four-thirds, which means eventually you need tanks to hold the blood, right? It can't be super linear. Okay. Anyway, <coughs> not so good. Okay, so I'm going to say this, and this was uh, the example I gave you is a, a strong one. Um, three, this is just a rule of thumb, but three, of three or more orders of magnitude in each dimension is great, right? So that's, that's kind of what you're looking for. Um, of course, you want to be able to explain why that scaling is there, and that becomes the big game. Uh, you know, it's not bad if, you, if you, you could have it so that, you know, one of them is, you know, not quite in that category. And if, if you... If you're getting down to less than order of magnitude, and there are many papers that publish this, and it looks like there's a nice little straight line, I'll show you a couple, I guess, uh, then you should be worried. It could be just anything at that point. So there's a proclivity to find power laws anywhere, right? People got a little excited. This is what happens. We're social beings, and there are just sort of decades of people finding them all over the place. But the three is a big deal. All right. <sighs> There's a guy from Norway told me that, I think. Jens, um, what's his name? Looks like Santa Claus, actually. So, All right. I always wondered. Uh, so we have, uh, here's an example. This is, a, this is a good paper, and Louis Betancourt is an excellent character, but this is a questionable plot, and I'll show you some more of their work later when we talk about cities, which is fine. They use natural log, which is a debacle because, you know, you get a lot more 
you, you feel like uh, you know there are many more orders of magnitude until you realize that they've done something sneaky. I mean, at least they put LN, I suppose they tell you that. But this is not good. This is a very weak scaling, right? So the exponent is 0.093. There's some reasonable fit. So what is this? This is population of cities, and this is the average walking speed of people in the city. So some poor graduate students were forced to, uh, requested to um, go and watch people walk around and, and, um, and, and figure that out, right? Uh, <coughs> I don't know who did that. But uh, this is pretty, so you see here, this is a really small range in, in variation here. And I don't think this holds up with other studies. But this is a, people like this result, so they, they keep kind of putting it out there. So bigger cities, people you know, move faster as they walk around because it's more exciting and so on. But there are definitely, and we'll get to this, there are some, it, it does seem to hold up. The bigger cities have a number of interesting superlinear scaling. There's a superlinear scaling that, that shows that bigger cities will have more crime, but more innovation, more wealth, right? So there's, there's social things that tend to go up, but not all of them. There's, there's more stuff being added, and I have that in here later. All right, so that's a bat. I'm just going to say no, right? Don't do that. Uh, other pieces, all right? So, so Powell is there's some kind of scale invariance, right? So that if if you, you resize your trees or your animals in the right way, then there's there's something about this a sameness to them. And it could be just a really simple one where it's just a zoom or a zoom in or a zoom out, and that's fine. You know, whatever design principles behind these uh, elements. Is, is kind of operating the same way, but it could be that as they get bigger, something comes into play. All right, so they can be all sorts of things. It could be time, we could be talking about time series, right? F um, you know, financial time series, right? You can zoom in and zoom out. Uh, famously in uh, geology, right, you always have to put a hammer somewhere so people are human, so people know how big the thing is, because otherwise it could be, you know, 100 miles across or like three feet across. So like it's really, the really a spectacular feature, this sort of similarity of cross sales. Uh, so it could be statistically the same, and often that's true, right? So it might be just that this li little bit of this wiggly bit of this time series looks statistically like this bigger wiggly bit. Um, <coughs> could be shapes, could be all sorts of things. So scaling, big deal. And we're really scaling, we're going to change the units of measurement, right? We're going to rescale it. All right, so let's look at how that works. So this is our simple one, y equals c to the c x the alpha. So if we rescale it, right, we're going to change from fathoms to, um, you know, feet, right? Whatever we're going to do, we're going to change our system. Uh, and we're going to change our measurement over here. So we can just rescale each one in the right way. And of course, we've thought about this, so we've put the right things in. So we're going to rescale x by an r and y by r to the alpha. And if we do that, then the overall equation doesn't change, right? So we're going to stick these in, x is r, x to the prime. I guess I don't need to have that. Right, that's all we're doing. We're just going to take x, put it in here, y, put it in here, uh, and then clean things up a little bit, right? So these these out of the alphas are here. I'm going to pull this one over here. There's an out of the alpha pops out. Uh, we've still got our constant c in front, and these guys are the same, right? That's okay. We still have the same equation. We still have whatever it is. is they're being measured in different units, but we're we're good. Okay, so this is scale invariance. Now, you don't get that with everything else, right? So uh, this is just an exponential. There's a, there's a length scale involved in exponentials, and it's really in this lambda, so we'll get to that. So we're going to try this same thing. Let's rescale x, and you can't pull this r out, right? You can't get this back to being e to the minus lambda x prime. You can't retrieve the same. That's all. Can't retrie retrieve the same functional form. Uh, so scale matters for the exponential, and, uh, you know, Typically, we like to talk about this, 1 over lambda. This is just a sort of human thing to do, but there's a scale in here. So 1 over lambda is when this becomes e to the minus 1, which is, you know, 1 over 2.7, which is sort of, you know, not small or big. Uh, depends on what you're talking about, of course. But that's often what's done. And then we have this idea that if x is much greater than that value, then y is small. And if x is much smaller than that value, then it's large. <coughs> You know, on, on the scale of what y can be, right? So, but there is a length scale 
in, so we've got this exponential, there's a length scale in the middle that's characteristic, right? If we measure the mean, if this was a distribution, we measure the mean of it, we get this, it depends on this. If we measure means of um, power law decaying distributions and, and other kinds of moments, it's nothing to do with the inside scales. It's only the outside scales. Right? There's no internal scale that really pops up. Talking about trees, so here's this tree idea, right? So isometry. And of course, this doesn't depict enough, right? This is, this is just like two examples, but you'd have to have many, many more examples going out here, showing you as you scale and scale and scale, that they look the same, right? So there's just a, a pinch zoom thing would retrieve that one over here. But we'd have to do something different here. We'd zoom it in this way, but we'd have to squish it more this way, right? So this is allometric scaling. I'm not, sh not saying that trees do that. All right, so differential rates of... Um, of, of uh, so in this case, it's body parts or process. There's a couple of different meanings. I know this is blown out, but this is this term, allometry, <laughs> which started in back here, actually, in 1936 in, bio in uh, Nature. Uh, this is uh, Julian Huxley, oldest Huxley's brother, who I will say was a raging eugenicist, unfortunately. Um, and that's why oldest Huxley wrote Brave New World, because his brother was like this. As far as I understand, his brother was had different views of humans, uh, and wrote a book with H.G. Wells, who, had, who was kind of aligned with Huxley's idea, uh, the, the Julian Huxley. Anyway, we, we, we are really trying to evolve. Um, uh, but, uh, so, but it is of the oldest Huxley category. Anyway, they were back there, and they're trying to say, we need some general term to kind of capture this. And this is really just in biology. But this term is now spread out to you know, be used in whatever you're talking about, cities, um, social phenomena. Uh, if we want to go back into physics, we'll talk about it there too. Sorry to bring up a bad thing. Um, I actually, and I don't know if any of you have been to Shelburne Farms, the inn. There are a lot of old books in their library there, and I found one of uh, a Huxley book and a H.G. Wells book there. Interesting reading. Okay. Um, <coughs> So isometry is same measure, al the, the, the allo means other, right? So that's what they're trying to get to with that uh, thing. So it could be that we have some nonlinear scaling of a dependent variable and an independent one, or it could be just two relative, two, two, um, you know, two variables, two correlated measures, uh, white and gray matter. We're not going to say that they, you know, one governs the other necessarily. All right, I'm going to go through a few pieces uh, to give you some uh, examples of uh, fr from all over the place, and and this this is a an old, you know obviously an old book now, but it was a part of a Scientific American series uh, on these kind of very nice coffee table books. You know the equations are in there, but beautiful pictures and and nice writing and so on. So this is uh, McMahon is sort of a famous character here. Um, <coughs> you know it's interesting to look at uh, the possibilities of things, right? So. Uh, this is a sore point for dinosaur people, is that they don't have the biggest animal ever, right? That's still an issue. Uh, this is the biggest land mammal ever, and this is a human, so that was pretty terrifying. Uh, I think they've changed the name of this one, but it's Bellocotherium. Uh, <coughs> you know, these are our largest jellyfish, which is also terrifying. Largest lobster is down here. This is the largest, is that the largest egg? No. No, it's a bivalve mollusk. The egg's on the next one. That's a bivalve, yeah. Uh, and here's a sequoia, right? So there are, you know, and you can, there are efforts to understand how big trees can get to, and 100 meters seems to be, you know, as big as they can be. Blue whales do seem to have reached the, the maximum of what, what uh, our oceans could carry. Uh, the mammoth, this is the ostrich, but the mammoth bird was heavier and had the biggest egg, but that was on Madagascar and is no longer around because of us. Um, I throw a sheep in here for fun. So these are the largest of things. Then these are kind of typical, um, you know, and all of this is to show like what biology has produced is kind of crazy in terms of scale. And I'll have another plot at the end of this. This is sort of just typical things that are our size. Uh, smaller, right? So this is the smallest frog. And that's a, uh, to give you a sense, that's an ant. So that is a pretty small bit of frog that somehow got put together. Uh, snails can get pretty small as well. What else we got in there? Oh, and then it gets a little gruesome over here. There's a, uh, you know, a, a human liver cell for some reason. But you know, these are smallish pieces. And this is the tick. This is the flea's leg, I think. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. So 
the foreleg of the flea, right, that's right, to get the scale. This leg here is this leg here, right. So it is kind of amazing uh, what life has produced, and this, this gives us a sense of the whole thing, if you can read these numbers. It's 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the 8, so there's 21 orders of magnitude uh, in, in mass, which is uh, ridiculous. I mean, that's unbelievable. That's a huge range of scales. And so this gets a little bit to the, uh, you know, and I don't know how well this holds up these days, but this is a number of cell types, right? So this is uh, element, uh, one of our element stories, like how, how many things do you need to build this Lego set of a blue whale? Um, and, well, there are different scales, but at the, cells, the cell type scale, uh, it, it goes out to about 100. Right, so this is a very slow scaling, but as we've kind of moved up through um, complexification through life, uh, we've we've gotten to we've had to add more pieces, right? And biology and e evolution is very uh, not conservative, but it 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 does a it it does a great job with stuff that it's already got, right? It has to there's a limit, yeah. Whereas, you know, when, and I know I keep talking about Lego sets, but it is sort of really an issue because they, your Lego sets used to be like this, but now they're, there's all these very specific little parts. So, because we don't have to um, build on things from before. All right, so allometric scaling is very interesting. This is, this would be, so this is where rescaling doesn't work, right? So it shows us that we've got some allometric behavior in, this is for growth. Al allometry was often thought uh, connected to growth of things. And so this is a baby, uh, which would be absolutely terrifying, right? Like our brains would explode <laughs> if such a... But when they're little, super cute, you know? <laughs> so it's all good. It all makes sense. They have a giant head, and you're like, yes. Um, which is true for me. So, uh, but, I, but I know it is true, Joe. Right? So, but yeah, this is scaling up different ages, right? So this is six point. This is, yeah, yeah. Um, and it kind of sorts itself out. But we're totally happy with this whole thing, as long as they're the right size. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yes, humans, very odd. Uh, yeah, we're born too early, right? We're really useless. Okay, so, uh, okay, so this is uh, looking, uh, tracking through the growth of uh, children. This is their body height, just in centimeters, right? So this is just a foot. This is just starting out. And then um, moving across this way. So what happens is, um, early on, this is arm length. Early on, the slope is faster, right? So your arms are catching up to the noggin situation, because if they don't, you're, it's not going to look good. And uh, then later on, it folds over to being an isometric or a, or a linear scaling. So it has to be slightly faster than, so super linear, rolling over to sub sublinear. Now, pretty limited scaling here, it's true, right? Pretty limited scaling. It's fair enough. But this is a touch of an example of what happens a lot in many systems is there is a crossover in scaling and there are two regimes scaling. You often talk about this. So this is a very common thing. We're pretty bad, I think, um, because we're really, yeah, you know, like most other organisms come out, mammals come out and they're like, they can get going. Yeah. Yeah. We cannot do anything yeah i mean it's really remarkable right like sitting up takes months smiling takes months which is that's not nice but um it just comes when you're about to give up um so you yeah, know that seems to work uh, <laughs> anyway yeah so we're in a bit of a funny category here so lots of the millions of other things i'm going to you know get through i'll show you a couple before we finish today this is from so this is a fun thing to kind of look at again now. Uh, these are, this is the body weight of the world record uh, holder for um, weightlifting. And I don't know what this one was for, if it was for, you know, the combined weights or whatever it is, but this is the weight they lifted. And so the scaling here is pretty close to, what do I have it? Up there, two thirds. Right, so this is a sublinear scaling. So you make a, you, Bigger and bigger humans, they don't just lift, you know, proportionately more, right? It folds over. So it's a, it's not, so if you, you know, renormalize it, it's the, these characters down here are doing fantastically, right? Yeah. 
So in some sense, these are the best. You can also do this thing too, and we'll come back to this as well, where you can do the line of best fit and then look at the residuals and see which ones are kind of off, right? So if you then, so what we're doing is we're taking out what the fundamental kind of biological story is here and then seeing if anyone's above or below this. You can do that with cities, right? You can do that with crime or um, innovation, and I'll show you some plots of this later, where you fit the scaling, right? So you have city size and you fit, say, you know, um, number of patents, for example, and, and then look at the residuals and you can say, well, this, you know, for a city of this size, it's doing well. So it's a way of, in that case, you know, bringing everyone back together. So this is, this is a way, this gives us a way to compare, you know, the heavyweight character to the smallest one in a, in a fair way, right? So a naive thing would be to just, you know, divide the weight they right, just divide the, the weight they lifted by their own weight and then compare across. And if you did that, these would be the champs. But if we kind of put the physics of the thing in. So the argument for that one, and I don't know if, you know, there's an argument that's completely um, agreed upon, but it's the idea it's cross-sectional, right? It's not your volume. It's now about a cross-sectional thing because you've got to push up in this way. So, and when we talk about volumes and surfaces and lengths, so if you go from a mass to a surface or to a two-dimensional part, then that's mass to the two-thirds, right? Divide, power of a third gets you back to a length scale, and we're thinking of volume and mass being proportional, gets you to a length scale, and then the two gets you to a surface. Uh, okay, I'll show you one more here, and then, then we should go. This is uh, scaling, and this is you know, nature paper here. Um, <coughs> they love this sort of thing. This is the, the speed of runners, right? And so this, and swimmers. So Running is here and swimming is here. Um, and then so it's um, men and women. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so women are here, men are here. And so it's running and swimming. And we're terrible. It's like, you know, we think we're fast swimmers and everyone watches, but, you know, it's incredible. Watch Phelps and you've got a million. But, you know, you can just sort of walk alongside the water. And it's like, that is not very fast. <laughs> it's really disappointing. Um, and a fish would just go. Anyway. We get excited about it. But there's a break in scaling, like a clear break in scaling here, and it's around about 150 seconds. If you watch, uh, you know, if you know 800, 800 is sort of a transition, right, in running. 400 down, the sprinters kind of all look somewhat the same. And then when you get to 800, you start to have characters who are much more long distance kind of people. And you can also have a little bit of strategy in there, right? You can actually not always run. 400, you're just going to kill yourself. <laughs> um, 800, a little bit off it. <coughs> okay, and then, so very small scaling regimes, and then the last one, so it's this anaerobic aerobic transition, right? You use up all the stuff that's just sitting in you. Um, running decays faster than swimming. This is another nature paper, and this is the last one I'll show you today. Uh, this was a scaling, this is for the 100 meter sprint time, right? So 1900, and then this at this time, this was 2004, so they had data to here, Right, so they've got, the right, they've got the data to here, and then they did a linear extrapolation. I don't know how this got in nature, but anyway, whatever. It's the, the, end, uh, the end result was, so here's women, of course. Right? So women are going to be running faster than men in 2140. Um, there's also, this is seconds, so there's zero down here, right? So apparently, they'll get there before they start it. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Not the best bit of analysis, but anyway, they, they, they get a lot of press for that one. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of things, like we'll, we'll go through this on Tuesday. You can work on some of this stuff as we go through it, but there's going to be, you know, all sorts of good things, right? Okay, thank you, and I'll send an assignment out and tweet about it, which is exciting. Oh, Slack, yeah. All right, good, scaling. So we got to this last, uh, we got to this piece here uh, where we started off on biology. I'm just going to skip back to where we were. Um, I will really, okay, it's possible. Could be a roboctopus. Yes. Very nice. Uh, <coughs> hiding there. I'm going to see if I can fix up the, the projector. Projectors are, well, it works, so it's, that's a good thing. But this should have more details. Anyway, all right, so we went through this, uh, th these old examples. This is a you know, really important plot, and this is an old thing now. It'd be interesting to see this updated. Uh, but the number of uh, 
so this is cell types, right? So we had this piece about atoms, right? There are only maybe 29 different types of atoms running around inside us, which is pretty crazy in terms of Legos. And then once you make them into functional cell units, then you don't need so many of those either, you know, for, for even a, a whale, right? These are small numbers. Okay, that was disturbing. Let's go past that, right? <clears throat> um, allometry, as we talked about, uh, often was used in the past perhaps to talk about uh, growth, but, uh, which it can, of course, can always be talked about in that way. Uh, this was the running and swimming thing. We'll have a little, this is for humans. We're pretty terrible at it. Uh, this was the ridiculous thing where we saw that people eventually run 100 meters in zero seconds. All right, <clears throat> linear extrapolation. All right, so here's, here's just where we would sort of continue on. Uh, this is another peculiar plot. Uh, this is a, a horn length, right, as a function of uh, the skull length. This is a very small scaling if you look at this, right? So this is half an order of magnitude, right? So 32 is half, yeah. So very, very small. But there's a claim here that this is growing like uh, to the power of four. All sorts of things floating around. These are just weird ones. So here's a particularly famous one in biology that I go into much more in the next course in, in, in coconuts, but I'll just lay out what the story is. If you've seen this before and you have a particular view of how this works, I want to you know, sort that out right now. So here's a shrew. As I said, these things get down to a couple of grams, not so many. Uh, 3,000 kilograms over here, 4,000, something like that for, for elephants. So it's a you know, really nice range, uh, for mammals at least. Uh, and there's this you know, very basic question you might ask, and this connects deeply then into how ecological systems work and how life works on, on a planet. So we've got some energy usage by organisms, right? We're these funny things. We're eating food and so on. Um, we get very worried about that, but a lot of animals just eat their food. Uh, so we've got some, this is power, right? So this is basic, basic, basal metabolic rate. So this is, you know, watts as in, you know, joules per second or something like that, energy per unit time. Uh, and then mass. So mass is the, uh, it, metaphorically, the elephant in the room. When it comes to uh, organisms, we think about all the other pieces they have, but mass is their big, right? That's the, the big index that you might start with. So how does this thing scale? So you would expect it not to grow faster than one. That would be a little crazy, right? So superlinear would be a lot. Uh, and sublinear is possible. Uh, there's a good reason for that. See, elephant shrew, which is a confused state of being. OK. Uh, so. Nice. So we've talked about prefactors a little bit. Often they're left out, as I've kind of pointed to as well. So that can depend on um, possibly body temperature. It's a nice little story here, poten potentially. So birds run a little hotter than us. Right? A little bit of evolution there. Um, got them to flying, which is pretty crazy. Coming out of dinosaurs. Strange story. But uh, they're a little bit warmer than us. Uh, we run around here, eutherian, right, placental mammals, marsupials, got the pouch situation, right, so a little bit, just a different branch. Turns out they run a little cooler. And monotremes, here are the fine exponents of these units here, the platypus and the echidna, the only ones we know about. Uh, there are a couple of types of echidna. Anyway, they are somehow, uh, you know, closer, <laughs> they, they, these are closely related because they lay eggs, right, which is just like, what are you doing, right? So they, they'll, they'll, these guys lay eggs, amongst other things. Um, beaks and the whole business, right? When the early Europeans doing all the fun things in the world when it came back from Australia with one of these, they, that was sort of uh, thought to be in the kind of category of stapling things together, which a few of them had done, right? You know, that was sort of an old trick, right? I've got this funny new animal, this chimera that I made with my sewing kit, but actually this turned out the beak was stuck on, right? This was really, you know, really how it is. Okay, excellent animal. Um, but this is an interesting idea, right? So that they run a little, so this prefactor goes down a little bit. Birds run hotter. All right. Anyway, but the scaling you might think is this, two thirds, dimensional analysis, right? This is again, which we'll get to with Buck and Pi a little bit more generally. So power is going to be proportional to surface area, which is proportional volume to the two thirds. This is area, volume is length cubed, this is length squared, so this would be a volume to the two thirds. And if density doesn't change much across these organisms, then mass to the two thirds. So why is it that? Because you'd think, you know, you're giving off energy, you have to be balanced. You're giving off energy uh, in other ways, right, depending on what kind of organism you are. Uh, breathing, for example, right, lets out a certain amount. We, we um, um, you know, dogs pant and all sorts of things. We sweat. There's a sort of strange mechanism. But there's just simple heat loss, right? Uh, 
strange things of sort of becoming, it, it's thought, so if you do a marathon or something and you, you know, really hard work, you can lose many pounds, right? Some people will lose a lot of pounds. It turns out apparently that's not all just water. The idea was that was all water, right? And then we go to this bad place where people just replenishing themselves with water uh, potentially it became fatal, right? This hyponatremia because they thinned out their um, electrolytes so badly. That, and it looks like you are low on water, so people have more water, and, and then that pushes them past a threshold. But it may be just uh, energy right, being consumed, right? You're actually losing the energy that's stored in your body, and it's being put out as carbon dioxide. Hard to measure. All right. Okay, but this is a fair thing that we, we, we you know, this is why we can use the infrared thing to find people at night and so on. Only for good reasons, because um, we give off heat. So isometric scaling, right? And it's not quite a spherical cow, but at least you know we've got our, as we go up through our shapes, that uh, that nothing's being stretched in a in a weird way, right? Allometric is not the same. Okay. A uh, little physics joke there. All right. So log normal fluctuations. This is a detail, but you expect to have say Gaussian fluctuations in the log of p as a function of of um, mass. Fair enough, right? For brain size, the koala is down the bottom. All right. Okay, so Stefan Boltzmann law, you don't have to worry about this too much, but this is this uh, you know, amazing achievement coming out of uh, physics about 100 years ago, I suppose, that uh, the energy lost out of a black body is proportional to its surface and then temperature to the power of fourth. So surface, again, so surface area is just sitting there, kind of it makes sense. And in fact, if you do the calculations, you can, you, you can see this with a lot of data. But there's been about 100 years where close to 100 years now, I guess starting in the 20s, where people have said this, they've espoused that it's three quarters. And this is in textbooks, it's a very strange result, it's just a difference of a twelfth, two thirds to three quarters. So it means that as you go up through mass, that biology, for whatever reason, evolution is producing bigger and bigger organisms, and they have to run at a slightly lower, a higher power than you might expect. Just a, this is not their maximum performance, right? This is just basal, it's just you know, sitting there, keeping alive, like Pratchett basically does. Okay, so this is a bit odd, and I, I, as I said, it's a, it's a thing we, we'll talk into, uh, talk much more about in the next uh, um, uh, course. So, so it would suggest a kind of an inefficiency, right? Somehow it's not working out. There's a beautiful idea that, well, let's think about it. We've got a supply system, right? It's a network story. We've got a heart beating, and then a network coming out of that, right? So we've got our arterial blood flow going out, venal blood flow coming back in, and we're distributing to all these little sources, all these little capillaries. It's a very, you know, fantastic kind of story. Um, and you might think, well, how does that work with cities and all other sorts of things where you've got, you know, material going in and out, in that case, maybe people. Uh, let me just point out a couple of other pieces. So then if this is true, then you get all these other things. Number of capillaries is scaling as mass to three quarters, so it's actually, so the, so if you like, the density is going down right, as you get bigger. Time, this is a beautiful one. These are not necessarily true. I'm just saying that this is, this is how it sort of all spreads out. Time to reproductive age scales as mass to the quarter, so that's slow, right? So you can double the uh, size of something, and you, don't, you certainly don't get any close, uh, anyway, close to doubling how long it takes to reproduce. Heart rate goes down, so, and this is true, right? Heart rate, if you get a hold of a mouse and the tickers are going very fast, and right, it goes down as you get bigger. So the trend of these things are true, right? So time to reproductive maturity goes up. Yes. That's different to lifespan. Lifespan's quite weird. You can get cockatoos or whatever that live for 100 years and can say swear words that your great-great-great-grandparents said, or beautiful things, whatever it was. Um, uh, Cross-sectional area of the aerosol, so this is connecting to this blood, the, the flow idea, right? So that's scaling. Uh, another potentially powerful one, population density. So a couple of these fit together in really nice ways. I'll talk maybe a little bit about the heart rate one. But uh, population density, so if this is really going in, in exactly the opposite way to that energy usage one, which is mass to the three quarters, supposedly, then these balance out. And it means that elephants are sparsely distributed and mice are much closer together. But as a collective, they use the same amount of energy, which is very, so that's a very interesting ecological story. It may not be three quarters, right? But that broadly, roughly, may be true. Uh, and if it got out of balance, then maybe you know the, the bigger things are using more, or the little things are using more uh, as a as a collective. All right. So maybe this is true, but let's just put in uh, these these exponents. 
And then if you multiply these things together, right, so the average number of heartbeats in a lifespan, right, is, put these things together, mass to the zero. So there's this notion, and it ends up in poems and all sorts of things, that mice have the same number of heartbeats, about one and a half billion or something, as elephants do. They just run at a faster, faster thing. And it's roughly true, right? So this is actually roughly true, right? It's, it's true that, you know, they don't live as long and their heartbeats faster. So there, but this is going to be scattered. And it'll be an interesting thing to really dig out some data on that um, going ahead. Anyway, so 1.5 billion. <clears throat> anyway, so the Church of Porterology gets a tarot card for itself. Uh, the, it turns out that uh, you can, there's, there's been an amazing amount of arguing about this, and, and that's all I want to, okay, there's this too. Um, uh, again, it's next semester. There's been an amazing amount of uh, arguing and theoretical sort of development, remeasuring things and so on. Two-thirds holds up re remarkably well, and it just turns out that people did some bad things with slide rules and all sorts of stuff that triggered this whole kind of social um, kind of phenomena basically within science that, that hurt it in the way of this three quarters thing. So it matters, you know, deeply. Uh, this is how we, you know, what do we understand about life itself? Uh, and then things like toxicity, for example, if you have something for a mouse, how do you scale that up to a human? So there's some very, you know, uh, important uh, things that come out of it. All right. Biology has some other funny ones floating around. This is uh, uh, the number of species as a function of area. Very crudely, very roughly, it seems to, it, it goes up, it doesn't grow up linear, go up linearly, uh, but on islands, maybe to a quarter power, and then on land, if you have, block your land into little pieces and then count the number of species, which is hard to do, uh, it scales more slowly. Uh, you know, and if you go back to the original papers, they are definitely messy things. Um, can I get this to work? Yeah, so this is the evolution. Oh, it popped up for me. I actually just want this. You know, so, you know, it's not too bad, right? This is, uh, this is three orders of magnitude here. So there's some measurement here, and there's only a couple this way. But as we talked about, this is a good spread this way. At least, you know, whether it's good scaling, it's got a good range. Uh, area gives you a bonus because of the square, right? So in terms of length scale, it's not as, not as strong. But it's going up, and it's not going up, you know, linearly, right? So this is an interesting thing. So it's a really, I think, remains a, a, uh, it's just not understood, right, why that would be. Sublinear, you, you can sort of argue, like, why is it sublinear? Fair enough, you, you might be able to do that. Excuse me. Uh, uh, but there's many papers on that. All right. Okay, so... Again, we're going to give you a lot of examples. This may be, unfortunately, hard to read. I'll try to get that thing fixed. So uh, this is a paper from just a few years ago, uh, and it had a bit of a difficult thing to stomach uh, in terms of uh, cancer. So uh, cancer rates in that here's a plot of lifetime risk uh, as a function of uh, turnover rate for cells, right? So what's the cell division rate? And this is actually just sort of expressed as total number of cell divisions, but you can think of it as rate. So higher rate, higher chance of cancer, basically. And there's, if you put a line through this, it's roughly maybe two thirds, right? So maybe there's a, there's a scaling there that could be understood from a failure mechanism point of view, some kind of, not a simple failure mechanism, but something. Uh, it's something we've tried to think about. That's sitting there as, I think, an open question. The problem with this is that it just says, you know, it's bad luck, right? You've got your little cells and running, doing all their little replicating and crazy things, and they, things just go wrong. So this is a, this was a, this, this, this sort of story came out, and it's like, well, you can go and eat as much um, whatever you want and, you know, smoke as much as you want. But if, <laughs> that, that got a little f further away, because uh, it, this is, um, it does have a number in here where you have, this is lung cancer and lung cancer, so this is smokers and non-smokers, right? So that's a, you know, order of maybe order and a half, a factor of 30 to 100 more. So there are a number of pieces like that where, you know, that you've, there's some environmental thing that's happening and, and that makes, makes sense, all right? So it's not, a, it's not a do whatever you want situation. It's not just a, yeah. Josh, I'm just curious on your thoughts of like interpreting the residuals yeah, so we'll have, I'll have some examples of that. Um, the koala was a good example, right? So some of these things, so if it's just, you know, there's some sort of randomness in, in the way these things are made, then this is, you kind of hope that there's a nice distribution, Gaussian distribution out around here 
in log space. And it, you could be able to explain that from sort of a growth mechanism. Right? So these things are growing. They're making some errors in how they grow. This is not, not necessarily this example, but you know, maybe this is organisms and something to do with them, right? So that as, this, as you produce bigger and bigger things, there's some fluctuation in how they're produced. And so you get some, vari you get an average trend, right? But you get a variation around it, which on a log scale is Gaussian. So it's gonna be Gaussian like this, but of course there's a bigger spread. So usually what happens is, in fact, there's a distribution here and a distribution here and a distribution here. It doesn't have to be Gaussian or log normal that can be collapsed. And you do that as well, right? So you might want to actually collapse the whole thing. So I'll give you a couple examples in a little bit about cities and so on, where it's, it's quite instructive to look at the residuals because you know, they're, they're anomalous in some way. And, and this, if we could collapse all of the, if we have a good reason for putting a two-thirds line here, collapse them all down, then we could say, well, you know, relative to its stem cell division, like if we take that factor out, this is the worst cancer, for example, or the, you know, you do that sort of thing. So, okay, well, I'll get to some examples. Um, but yeah, very, very important thing. Often this spread is, is you know, considerable and needs to be thought about. So here's another good example where, right, and in preparing this, I was thinking about exactly this, right, this range here, this is two orders of magnitude, right? And so what we're plotting is, sorry, this is the maximum speed of these organisms. So some scientists, you know, makes it, go as fast as it can, um, and divided by, because uh, scientists are such good people, so divided by their length, the body length, right? So it's normalized by just that piece. Uh, so, so what this says, really, and, and so we have a constant, and this is 22 orders of magnitude for body mass, right? Which maybe is seven orders, seven orders of magnitude for a length scale, right? Because body mass is a length cubedish kind of thing. So it makes it, body mass and volume always make it look more impressive, right? Because you're covering many more pieces. So let's say it's seven-ish, but you know, 22 in terms of mass. And then this, there's some variation here, right? So this is, again, you know, two orders of magnitude here that it's kind of floating around in. But you know, fair enough, a fit for this is flat. It's flat, right? So this says as, uh, as, we, as evolution produces bigger and bigger things, sometimes it goes the other way, but generally it produces bigger and bigger things that's going to fit within this sort of corridor of what's possible in terms of speed. And this is, this is only for, right, so this is only for uh, running species and swimming ones, right? So it's a mixture of mammals. We've got a few struthius birds floating around in here. Um, <coughs> ants, again, making, someone has, some graduate student has to time some ants. Um, I guess there was no gambling involved, hopefully. But um, <coughs> ethics, we will not gamble. <laughs> uh, okay, so, and we get out to an elephant out here. Obviously, I had fun drawing these things. Uh, fish, let me see, so let's, let's get this right. So the, the magenta ones, which are a little hard to see, so this is the running ones. Um, the green ones, so, yeah, non-mammals are in green. Okay, non-mammals are in green, so that's our ants and so on. And then we've got a lot of swimming ones, so the swimming ones are back here as well. Okay, two human ones. This is the fastest running speed for a human. This is the fastest swimming speed. You know, this is, what is this? It's not, maybe it's a, not an order of magnitude, but maybe eight, something like that. We're, we're not, you know, water is a hard thing to move through for us. We're very slow. Birds, of course, would create a whole different piece here, and it's not in this one. Okay, so that's an interesting thing, right? So you, can, you, can you figure this out from maybe some sort of uh, back of the envelope derivation, and there's a problem for you in assignment one. You'll notice it kind of trails off here. And so the big story here was this, right? This paper gets published. This is the big story. We kind of have this thing about scaling here, and it's that this, if you like, they could have plotted as, you know, V max, right, as a function of length as well, and put that in there. So, or, or taken out this length, and you'd see it would go up linearly. <coughs> oh, yes. Yeah. So if you're normalizing by velocity and length is strongly correlated to body mass, then wouldn't you expect there to be a flat line? Uh, um, <clears throat> you, could, you could certainly put this over here and you'd have velocity going as, right, just scaling linearly. I mean, that's, 
That's the other way to do this. I, this isn't governing the whole thing. I mean, th th this is an important, you know, this is really what it's getting at. The velocity is there. And there's still a lot of room moving around in here. Uh, so that, that, that's an important piece. OK, there's a the paper that came. So this, these are recent papers. That's 2015. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so make sure you get my attention. 2000, I appreciate it. 2017 this is a couple of years later. They actually don't cite that paper. I mean, I know this is what happens in science. But it's, a, it's funny they didn't quite connect because they have the nice little pictures and stuff as well. Again, <clears throat> maybe the, I, I hope you can see this. Uh, flying, running, and now they're, so they're flying as well, uh, running and swimming. So this is now just speed and body mass, right? So this is taking away that funny business. And we have kind of a, a linear growth, but we have a turnover, right? So for the largest things, and I think, the, so in a way, that was the problem here. You lose this. You, you, you don't quite, you see something here, but you don't pick it up as clearly as you do if you just put mass and velocity, right? You keep it pretty simple. All right, so there's a rollover here. So the biggest things, and so I guess we're out here at uh, <clears throat> albatrosses. This is, OK, birds are running things and swimming things. And then uh, these are flying things. So this is right, this broken out here. And then it's, again, separated out into birds, arthropods, and mammals, right? We've got some bats in there. Uh, these are running things here. So birds, some birds run, of course. Ostriches are in there. <clears throat> arthropods and so on, emus, uh, reptiles, all sorts of running things. So they're kind of all generally you know, fitting together. There's definitely some separation between the, the three kinds of um, movement, or general movement. And then we've got the, the fishy things, octopuses in there. Um, <clears throat> so there's a whole range in there. Of course, that includes mammals as well. We've got some whales. The whole team is in, in a, lot of, a lot of different teams represented in the swimming situation. All right. All right, so they all have this rollover. And this is just this very nice piece of work to figure out why that is, right? So basically, how are we doing? Basically, the, the, the story is, let's see if you, we can get through this. Um, I think that's a porcupine, actually. That's a wolf, elephant, and a mouse. So they're the four sort of emblematic species of different um, organisms at different scales. And the idea is, this is their speed, that, this is the maximum speed, theoretical speed, they could get up to if you just sort of assume this linear thing growing as mass. Uh, and of course, a mouse doesn't take very long to get going, right? It just goes and it's at its maximum speed. Elephant has to wind it up. And the problem with that is you, it uses up all its like, energy that's just sitting there, right? It runs out, of, runs out of time. It doesn't make it to full speed. It gets to some sort of locomotive speed, but then it's, it, it runs out. So this is this. This is a plot of how long it takes uh, to get up to that speed. Uh, and I've got some other calculations for this, I suppose. But the point is they, they burn up all the, that sort of that power energy that they have. Because we have, right, we have different energy mechanisms or modalities. You have the stuff that can take you, you know, in 10 seconds as fast as you can, whatever, minutes, two minutes, and so on. All right, but they run out of gas, and so as a result, they never get to being as fast as something like a wolf or a you know, big cat, for example. Uh, porcupine speed, I guess, is, <laughs> is for elephants. So it's a, at least by this little, little schematic thing. All right, so that's, that's well done. It's about uh, the energy system that needs to be used. This is a calculation for it, but uh, you know, they do a good job. Fair enough. That's all good. OK, I think that's good. Uh, so. I think, yeah, they had an enjoyable literature search of maximum speeds of running, flying, and swimming animals. Um, <clears throat> escape speed, sprint speed, right. It's one of these things that depends on many other people having done lots of work in the past. You know, one paper per organism. This is, just to jump into something, we we'll move more into physics now. Of course, this is a human-made thing. This is a horsepower or brake horsepower for engines as a function of the mass of the engine, lots of different kinds of masses. This is from that uh, bon, uh, McMahon book, McMahon and Bonner book again, the Scientific American one. And this is the uh, RPMs, right? So cadence actually goes down. Humans are pretty good at 90 RPM. We like that for running and, and cycling. But um, that tends to go down, right? So we've built, we just built something. We want it to go faster. And this is you know, how things come out. Uh, this is a. Another result, this is not of a theoretical calculation, but this is an interesting little uh, observation about nails, right? So a very simple physical piece. So lots of nails, they're not isometrically the same, right? They're not a simple scaling of each other. 
and they tend to actually get thinner as, you, as we make them longer. So there's a little argument for why this is. Uh, if you can see up in, is that a good idea? No, I shouldn't do that. Oh, maybe. Um, yeah. So these are nails, right? This is a, uh, this is a slope of two thirds. This is their diameter and their length. Right, so diameter is growing as length of the two thirds, so it's slower than it's sublinear. So, and this is slope one, right? Again, on a log log plot, it's two thirds, so it's growing sublinearly. Uh, so they're not getting as thick, right? So if you double the length, you don't double the diameter. You do something less than that. Interesting. I don't want to there. Okay. So diameter is proportional to. Uh, you can figure this out from this. If you have this scaling. Length times diameter squared is proportional to volume. That has to be true, right? That's not going to go away. Right? That's the little cylinder things. Then this is the way they must fit together. So the diameter has to be proportional to mass to the two-thirds, or volume to the two-sevenths, I should say, or volume to the two-sevenths. Length is going to go like um, volume to the three-sevenths. So this, right, this length to the power of two-thirds, two-thirds of three is two, so we get back to diameter. That's the right thing. And to get to our volume, we need diameter squared times length times a pi. It's fine, but it's a scaling story. Length diameter squared times length. Two sevenths plus two sevenths plus three sevenths is seven sevenths. So that's how that fits together. So it's a peculiar scaling, right? The two thirds is sort of a funny thing, but then we've got out to sevenths here. From a, this is a physics thing. Sevenths should be there, but they are. Okay. So nails, nails uh, lengthen faster than they broaden, and this is, you know, we're making nails for a purpose, right? We want them to work. You know, we need them to be longer uh, for, for this particular thing, but we don't want to use too much material, right? That's a waste. We also don't want it to be hard to nail in, but we also don't want it, we don't want to make it too thin because it will break. So that's the argument uh, that's used for this. You need to know something from engineering, which we're not, you know, going to derive, but there's a, a result from um, engineering uh, on, on uh, buckling, right? So at what point will a column buckle uh, under load? And so that grows as uh, d to the fourth divided by length squared. So let's look at this, right? So this is really cross-sectional area, d squared squared. So there's a strong piece for, for diameter. So you know, if you double the thickness, you get a factor of 16, right? Two to the power of four. If you double the length, then uh, you get a four, but it's dividing it, right? So you make it longer, then it's going to be more unstable. Fair enough. Lengthening makes it more unstable. Thickening it makes it more stable. But thickening gives you a really strong returns, right? Really strengthens it quickly. Um, <clears throat> then, you, then we have to put in some other pieces. So this is the idea, right? This is, you, know, you, know, you can argue about this, but we're, gonna, we're driving this nail in, and there's a res resistance to it that's from the material that's around its circumference. And we suggest that that's going to be proportional just to the diameter. Maybe it's just sort of at the front of the, of, of the nail. So <clears throat> if these two things balance up so that you want a nail that's not too thick, not too thin, right? Too thick means you're using too much material. It's a little harder to put in. Too thin means it'll buckle. So then we're going to have these, um, you know, this matching up. And if you divide through by uh, d, you get a d cubed and put the L squared on the other side. And we've got this d is proportional to L of the 2 thirds. So a little bit of you know, magic. But you, need, you, know, you needed to know something quite substantial to get to that, of course. <coughs> OK. So it's a tour of these things. All right. So Galileo made this uh, argument about, uh, about uh, buckling and so on. Um, Euler talked about these things as well, another smart person. Um, <coughs> Right, and this is, uh, this is actually a science paper by McMahon. Um, and, you know, it's, it's it, 973. Let's get this one. This holds, some, some parts hold up, but it's, a, again, it's a size and shape in biology. You know, big, big story, right? So he has the buckling thing in here. Uh, tries to get at uh, shapes of organisms with, with this terrible Minecraft kind of idea. But... You know, there's a suggestion in here that they grow allometrically, which doesn't seem to hold up from larger, larger data sets. Um, anyway, OK, that's good. Let me go back to where I was. All right. This is in your uh, assignment. It's a very thin 
weak scaling, but a power of a ninth, it seems to do pretty well. This is for speed of a, of a rowing boat as a function of the number of oars people. Uh, and of course, very limited range of, of numbers, right? Just barely making it to one order of magnitude in terms of number of people. I guess the dragon boats maybe have more. Um, but it goes up very slowly. So, and it can be argued from a fluid mechanics point of view. All right. So, there are, you know, so there's just a, a zoo of these little kinds of scalings. So there are some very fundamental ones that are just floating around as well. So one of them is uh, gravity. Coulomb's law is, works in this way as well. But so the, the force of gravity between two objects of mass one and mass two, just multiply these so it increases linearly, right? This is a power of one here, a power of one here. And we live in three dimensions, so that's what the story is here. This is decreasing like a uh, inverse square law. And there's a sense here that that, that, that force as it goes out is, is equally kind of partitioned around the surface of the sphere that's at a distance that it has a radius r, right? So as it goes out, it's still there, but it's, it's weakened in, because it's being spread out over more space. And I believe this is true. If you go back to Newton's original work, he, he tried all sorts of things. He had R squared on top and R to the fourth and did some funny things, right? He did some odd things that we would be a little surprised to see. Of course, he, you know, well, before he gave up and went off to the Mint and made lots of money, he was also into astrology and everything. So, fun times. Um, now we just have conspiracy theories, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see. Shout out to the 17th letter of the alphabet. So, uh, we, the, you know, these are really fundamental things. Of course, this is a phenomenological piece, right? We, this works. Uh, you know, we need to have general relativity to improve on it, but we just have it. Okay, so uh, this is the dimension of a sphere surface, right? So that's, that's that one over R squared. It's sitting there. It makes some sense. Uh, it turns out that there's a lot of human phenomena for which there's a, a version of this, right? So we live essentially in two dimensions, right? We, we like to, we have some stairs and things and some tall buildings, but uh, we live in two dimensions basically, right? So uh, if you think of cities being spaced out on a map and how much stuff goes between them or people and various things, there's a certain number of phenomena that follow this, right? So the amount of stuff that moves between cities, for example, at least maybe at points in time, uh, tended to behave as population one times population two divided by radius. And it's just radius to the power of one because now we're in two dimensions and we're just we're worried about the circumference and that's growing like two pi r. So there's a version of the gravity law and it doesn't apply for everything, but um, that, that generalizes. All right, so that's, again, just a scalings in, in all sorts of things. All right, so let's, uh, this is for your assignment and just good general knowledge, Buckingham pi theorem, it's called, uh, with these sort of, that's not a bad title, I guess. Yeah, dimensional equations. You often hear the term dimensional analysis, right? Just saying, well, you know, if this thing is meters squared and this one is, you know, right, then we, we can only put them together in certain ways. Dimensional analysis is another term. Uh, all right, so I, I managed to dig this up. Uh, this is, in, you know, I came across this as a paper to, to read and I went to photocopy it because it's a long time ago. You would photocopy a lot of things. Um, that, that's all you had, right? You had to photocopy. And so you eventually just, you, be, you have all these books, all these journals to, to photocopy. You put them down, and you've got your little card. It was a whole mess, right? And just pushing it down and pressing go. And then eventually, you just leave it up. And you're just like, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you know, this is what graduate students should do. So um, it got bad. Uh, I remember once at Columbia going to photocopy a paper. And you know, it's a whole thing. It's not Googling, right? You have to sneak. Find the, pull out the thing, go to the page, and someone had torn it out. That was just such a dagger. I couldn't believe it. They just torn the whole paper out. At that point, I knew it was an important paper, but um, <laughs> so bad. Uh, okay. All right. Anyway, so it's a it's a beautiful old, beautiful uh, old paper, and of course, not the first person to find it. But it's named after this character, Buckingham, and the pi is just silly. We have pi, we should be just using pi for pi. It's just like it's a special one, or tau maybe, but pi, maybe some tau fans out there, right? Tau is two pi. So there's, a, there's a movement to make that the right one. Okay. All right, so, um, uh, 
OK, so here's the idea. We've got n related quantities. We've got some system. We've got n quantities that describe it. Right, so for gravity, we've got mass, mass of the two objects and the distance between them. There's some other weird things that gravity exists, for example, but you, know, you start to lay out your pieces. Uh, and somehow we want, we, we hope there's an equation that, that ex combines them all, uh, and somehow we can you know, f figure out something about our system. And, and so we can always sort of write this down. We could make it equal to zero, which is a bit, it may seem odd to put it at zero, but you can always just lump everything across on one side. It won't tell a story properly, but we could always do that. So here's a simple example. So this is for just a square, area's length squared, right? It's the, um, and there's some notation here that I want to, to, to you know, get sorted out for you, right? So area's length squared. So our equation for this could be, right, a minus l squared equals 0. That's a weird way to express an equation for the area of a square, right? It's got length l, length l. That's an odd thing to do, but we could do it. We could put a over l squared equals 1, right? We could do all silly things like this. A bit odd. OK. Generally, you want to keep as much as you can. And algebra usually you know, destroys any story. But if you, you want to keep the story, of a physical story, inside your, the way you lay out equations. All right. So what we want to do is uh, I should, I've got one more thing to say. So these square brackets will indicate dimension. What kind of dimension uh, is associated with this thing? And this just means, right, this, is none of, this just means length, right? So this is a length squared thing. It's not saying it's meters or furlongs or whatever. It's length squared. Length is, uh, of course, of just length by itself. So volume would be length cubed. Any mass, a body mass, would have just a big M associated with it. Anything that's got time would have time associated with a big T. There are main units. There are others, but there are main units we'll worry about. Uh, there's a footnote for us here, which is uh, right dimensions, furlongs, and smoots. Right, there are all sorts of funny units in the world. Let me um, enjoy myself for a second here. So, uh, yes, this is a strange business horsepower we had. That's dimensional analysis. There's the so-called um, furlong firkin fortnight um, system, because you could do this, right? So this furlong is an eighth of a mile. Um, so we actually used that on the farm I grew up with. 20 chains in a furlong. That's a cricket pitch. That's true. Uh, and then uh, you know, acre is uh, one furlong by a chain, right? Very weird things. You know, there's 11s in there. We talk about 12 being a great number, but there are 11s in the, in the the English metric system. Uh, so a firkin is maybe eight gallons, I think, and a fortnight is a very good term, 14 days, a fortnight. But you could, uh, you know, there's a madness here, right? So there's a uh, speed of light is 1.8 times 10 to the 12 furlongs per foot, fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> so people have had a great time here. Um, and then, of course, you find, right, list of humorous units of measurement. Uh, there's actually, and I think it should be in here, the smoot, right? So the smoot is if you uh, go to the what's called the Harvard Bridge between MIT and Boston and walk across it, you'll see smoots marked out. This is, a, this is like the highest level of MIT hazing, I guess. But there was a guy who turned out to be the shortest, in the shortest character in this incoming freshman fraternity. And they made him lay down over and over. And they measured the bridge in smoots and chalked it out. Right. So it's however many smoots plus an ear or something like that. And it gets repainted. And then I think the great thing is, here it is, um, it's the height of, in 19, that's important, it's the height in 1958 of Oliver Smoot, as measured by some idiots, uh, who, who later became the chairman of the American National Standards Institute. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then the president of ISO. <laughs> so he's like, I'm going to own measurement. I will get you guys back. Absolutely fantastic. There you go. He was five foot seven. Yeah. So Google Earth and Google Calculator include this. You can put in, you know, three feet in smoots and it will do it for you. Okay. And then it just obviously falls apart completely into other directions. Mm. Ah, it's great. Really good. 
Okay, so a furlong has the dimension of length, right? So does a smoot, right? So if we put a brackets around a smoot, we put an L over here. So we're going to say, uh, <laughs> it's so great. Uh, we'll say, hopefully we can reassemble all of this into P, right? At, the, at most n of them, but P independent dimensionless parameters. So here's our dimensionless parameter. This is one dimensionless parameter we could write down here, right? So we could call this one, in this case, pi 1 equals a over l squared, right? Or it could be pi 1 equals, you know, a cubed over, sorry, over length to the 6, right? That would work too. The dimensions of pi 1 equals um, 1, right? The, in the sense that there's no, there's no dimension. That's the way you write that. So if we could do that, then we have a chance of somehow putting this, w w figuring out what our basic equation might be made out of. And if we're really lucky, there's only one dimensionless unit, or parameter. There's only one dimensionless parameter, I should say. And then we know that that's a constant, right? We can't, we can't um, right, the, if I haven't quite made this clear, the big point is that you can't have an equation for a system that depends in any way on how you measure aspects of that system, the units, right? It doesn't matter if you use furlongs and fortnights or seconds or whatever you want, want to use. It can't matter. Okay, so that was our point that I just wrote on the board. F equals MA, right? So that's a weird thing to do, but this would be okay. This thing here has uh, no, it's dimensionless. Of course, we don't want to write it like that because, you know, there's a little story in, in how this thing works here. Okay, so this is a back of the envelope situation um, and allows all sorts of possibilities. This is really unfortunate. This is blowing out too much. This is a platypus. Let me describe the things. Uh, that's a mass of m. This is a pendulum. The platypus is the weight in this case, mass m. It's a perfect pendulum uh, with a platypus. And we've got a length here, l, and then, of course, the gravitational field. So these are the, the you could add other pieces, but these are the only things that really matter in here. Uh, and then there's the, uh, it's swinging back and forth, it's a perfect pendulum, and there's some um, period, right? So there's a time unit, there's a length unit for, for, uh, for the pendulum, the mass here, and then the gravitational field. So it's going to swing forever. So four quantities, as I said, length L, mass M, gravitational acceleration G, and the pendulum's period, we'll call it tau. Right? So, can... And of course, you can, so you can sort all this out, right? We get our calculus, we can do the whole thing, a little bit of physics, and we can think about how this swings, and we'll get out the actual, um, you know, f as a function of time, where this pendulum is. If we say, you know, start it at some point here and let it swing back and forth, we can, we can do the whole dynamical piece. Right, but we want to be sneaky than that. Lazy, I suppose. So let's look at these things. So there's the length of the pendulum. That has, um, its dimension is length. Mass, of course, is the mention of mass. Gravity is an acceleration term, so that's um, distance per time squared, right? So velocity is, dis is length over time. Acceleration is length over time squared. So that's what that is. And then period is, um, the period of the pendulum is just has a dimension t. So we have three, three pieces in here. There's length, there's a length scale, there's a mass scale, and a time scale. So somehow we have to combine these pieces or, you know, it's possible we may end up with, you know, when you come to this, it's possible there could be four independent scales, right? We could have a, one that's just mass, one that's just length, one that's just time, and one that's, say, Kelvin or something, right? That will be independent. But we can see there are three dimensions in here and four unknowns, so we've got a good chance of being able to put them together. So one thing you notice straight away with this is... Time is here, time is here, length is here, and length is here. Mass is only here. So this, just writing this out tells you straight away there is no way that mass, that the mass of the pendulum can be in the equation that we end up with because there's no other way to, com we can't combine the mass of the pendulum, uh, by which I mean this m, with any of these other variables such a, to get rid of it, right? So if we're measuring this in, you know, um, kilograms or something, there's no other thing that has kilograms in it that can be involved in some way, take the square root of it, you know, stack them on top of each other and, 
and eliminate the dimension of kilograms. So it can't matter. So that's a, that's a, a good thing to see straight away. All right. So envelope situation, we're gonna, we, we do this. So let's, let's just sort of write down the right things. So you're going to find all possible independent combinations of what we'll now we'll call Q1, Q2, up to Qn. So these are our, um, these are our uh, parameters. And we'll call these new ones. There'll be P of them. Uh, we'll call these, these uh, dimensionless quantities. Right? So these are things like this is our period of the pendulum, the mass of the pendulum, those pieces here. And these are some, there'll be some ratios, some things involving you know, powers stacked together, like this thing, A over L squared, for example. And we have to figure this out. So the way to do it is to say, well, let's just make a prototype one. So we'll say, you know, there could be more than one of them. So we'll say pi sub i uh, is going to be the first one. So again, this could be the length of the pendulum, the mass of the pendulum, the, the period of the pendulum. We'll raise them all to some power. And we want that power, those powers to kind of combine so that, that there's no dimension of the whole thing. All right, so we want to set these powers so that we get our dimensionless quantities. And the way to do that is you can just apply this sort of dimension operator, right? Well, what's the dimension of our pi sub 1? Well, it's the dimension of q1 to this power, right? So if this was a length, this is length, and this is 2, this is length squared. It's going to pop out the things we want, right? The dimensions of all these pieces, we need that to be 1. We need all of those powers to balance out. And it's good to go through the, the pendulum exercise. You know, you can, uh, you know, it's a good basic one. I think Kepler's law is in there now as well, which is a little bit more complicated. Uh, so the dimension of Q1, right, that was our length of the pendulum. That's just going to be this capital L, right? This capital L is a very special thing. It's not a parameter. It just means the length dimension. Uh, mass for the mass of the pendulum. Then we have the gravitational constant. So this was little g. That was length over t to the minus 2. And then we have the period. So it's t. So we can put all these pieces together. Yep. Right. So here's our little prototype one. We're going to stick it in here. Uh, the dimension is going to be length, right? Length to whatever x1 is, mass to whatever x2 is, uh, and then this length t to the minus 2, x3, and then t to the x4. Right, this is now just sort of a way of, you know, still in a, in a mathematical way, but these are, these are not, right, this doesn't have a dimension. This is just saying it's a, yeah, 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 yep. So we're going to regroup things, right? Length appears here and here. So this was the length of the pendulum, the gravitational constant. So we get a length to the x3, length to the x1. So we're going to have that length to the x1 plus x3. Mass is only here, as we said, by itself to the x2. Uh, and, and time we're going to collect from here and here. So there's going to be a minus 2x3 and a t to the x4. So these are independent objects, right? So we need this to be 0, we need this to be 0, and we need this to be 0. And that, that becomes our set of equations. Right? x1 plus x3 has to be 0, x2 has to be 0, already solved, and then these two have to be, this, this sum has to be 0. So this, of course, is, what are we doing now? It's linear, yes, it's linear algebra. It's matrixology. OK, so it's just quite delicious. So we can frame it very nicely in, um, yes, nutritiousness. OK, so we can write it down like this, right? We had uh, x1 plus x3 had to be 0. So that's what this first multiplication says. We had just x2 had to be 0 by itself. So that's what this is, right, this dot product. It's going to pick that one out. And then we had minus 2x3 plus x4. And that's what this last line says. So we had three equations, four unknowns, and uh, this ha our three equations have to be 0, 0, 0, right? And we stack them up, do the right thing. Uh, and uh, we do row, you know, row reduction on this, for example. You see you don't have to do anything straight away to see that this has rank 3, right? This, these are independent equations. Uh, so we see some good things. It's a null space problem, right? Yes? We want matrix sends this vector to zero. So which things combine, which vectors will you know, uh, be savaged by this, this matrix? This is just a little, if your linear algebra you need to refresh, then you should uh, look at this again. But uh, um, number of dimensionless parameters 
is the dimension of null space, right? So how, how big is your null space? And in this case, uh, it's n, right? So this is an m by n, right? So it's a 3 by 4. It's 4 minus the rank. Uh, four is the, n is the number of columns. R is the rank. So this is 4 minus 3. In this case, so it's just to you know, go through the linear algebra formalism, 4 and 3. Uh, so that means we just have one, right? There's only one dimensionless parameter. And uh, that means that the upshot of that is we don't have to think about some more complicated equation. We just know that there's only one way to combine them. Then it has to be a constant. Could have some funny piece, pieces to it, but uh, it's a constant, basically. All right, this is the general thing of what we just did, right? So this is you know, just formalizing it. You don't have to worry about it too much. Um, but it's very joyful. Null, null space is a spectacularly important thing. All right. Okay. And of course, you know, this is the sort of thing, if we go back to this, yes, you can just mess around with this, right? We know x1 is minus x3. We could substitute in that. You can just do it all by hand. That's true. But for larger systems, you know, you roll out the, uh, the linear algebra and do the right thing. And we have a bigger understanding here as well, right? So we know now that it's the number of original parameters, right, minus the, the rank of whatever the matrix is that we construct. So you can figure this out. Uh, there are d different ways to frame this, but essentially length divided by uh, the gravitational constant times tau squared. I guess that should be in brackets. But it uh, has to be a constant. And you could have this cubed or whatever you want, right? But basically, this, there's a length scale in here that gets canceled with the length scale here. This has two time scales, and this was length over time squared, so that cancels that as well. And so gravity is gravity. That's fine. And then we just have these two pieces sitting there uh, and gives us a, this very nice uh, observation, just, and again, could be just done on an envelope for sure, um, that the period of the pendulum is proportional to its length, which is a famous result, right? People figure this out by staring at pendulums um, early on. And then you know, we're able to derive it with calculus and all sorts of things. But this is a nice look. You could just argue this. I mean, you could argue this thousands of years ago, really, if you got this dimensional piece sorted out. I imagine there are situations where it's not obvious. Uh, the number of parameters that you need would not be obvious. Uh, the overall one? So there's, there's, so, so it's, well, okay, well, so, yep. Yeah, I, I mean, before, of course, you reduce it, you get a set of dimensionless parameters. But before that step, let's say you're just listing the set of parameters. Yeah. How do you, I mean, you don't, you may not know if that set is complete. Yeah, exactly. It's quite, that's so exactly right. So there's some magic in figuring out, and I'll show you some sort of profoundly <laughs> shocking ones in terms of their success. Maybe you've seen these things. But um, there's a lot of art in that part there, a scientific kind of understanding of what will really matter. And yes, you could be missing something. Which, you know, and then you, then you figure out that that's, that's, a, that's a problem. Um, but yeah, yeah. This is, these are sufficiently simple systems that we can get somewhere with it. So a really nice uh, Set of books, actually, really, I guess, from Barenblatt go into that in a really nice, in, in, a, in a full, deep way, and they worry about these sort of extra dimensions. Um, but it's got some beautiful stuff about scaling in there. Uh, so here's, okay, so it was the next one. Here's a, here's a pretty impressive uh, back of the envelope calculation about a dire thing. This is uh, the Trinity Test in New Mexico, 1945. This was published on the front of Time magazine, uh, you know, as a declaration, I suppose. It was released. This is the information was released to sort of show that the, um, you know, what the U.S. was capable of. Uh, and Taylor, who's an English uh, uh, fluid mechanics character, G.A. Taylor, just saw this and then figured out how much energy was in it, which seems absurd. But basically, they gave away all this top secret information by this picture. And what was in there was the there's a scale here, so you can figure out the radius of the blast and time scales, right? This is the Empire State Building, so you, could, you can figure that out. So he has that on his envelope, right? He was able to jot down the size of the thing uh, as it's growing. 
And, and he was, you know, this guy's a genius, right? So he's able to sort of figure out that this is all he needs. He wants to get to energy. He thinks the density of air will matter. But there are other pieces here, right? I mean, you kind of worry about the ground maybe and so on. But um, this, this was enough. Uh, there are four variables only th uh, and three dimensions. So again, we have the same as for the pendulum. There's only going to be one, one dimensionless parameter. Uh, it's a bit of an odd one. It ends up being like this, that the energy is going to be proportional to the radius to the power of five, uh, density of air is here, and then time squared. So um, you could figure it out. And this turned out to, to hold up and be you know, an accurate estimate. Right. The speed decays is one of our other three, three halves. So it's remarkable what you can get out from some, you know, you need some deep knowledge about things potentially, right? You, you really do. But in this case, I suppose, you know, we didn't, so for example, we needed to know about the buckling story, right? The d to the four over L squared for nails. There's really nothing like that here. This is just dimensions. So Radiolab, which I guess in my estimation is kind of a bit all over the place and has sort of gone downhill. They don't really talk about science anymore. Um, but uh, I think they took it off their little list of things they say they talk about. OK. It's a bit like uh, anthropology, right? Didn't, didn't they do that? <laughs> they said they took science out of the. Anyway, um, it's disappointing. Uh, <laughs> uh, so th but this is, this is a really uh, this is a impressive one. And if, you know, enough people were around these things, I mean, from the actual, you know, ones that were used in war, but also just radiation, that you have coding built into people and you can see, you know, um, see things from, you, it puts these time markers into them. Okay, so this is pretty weird. This is just back to units. We're still sorting them out. I, I'm sorry this is hard to, to read. This, the, the idea is that we're going to actually change the way things are measured, right? So the, this is a pretty bizarre story. Again, it's Radiolab, but here it is. Up until, and I don't know if this has changed yet now, but the kilogram has just been a kilogram in France. Like there is a metal thing that is the kilogram, right? So if you really want to measure a kilogram, you have to make another thing that weighs just as much as that. They did replace that. Anyway. So the problem was, right, that they cleaned it, yeah. and then it didn't match up with all the other ones that they'd made to copy it. So it was like a grain of sand difference. And you know it's a disaster, right? So it's not derived from anything. So has it been replaced now? Because there are copies. Yeah, I think they. Well, the idea is to replace it completely, so it's not dependent on any actual artifact. And, and it was the only one. So you can see here, right? There is a kilogram, and then the rest of them are derived from all sorts of. Uh, well, so uh, Av Avogadro's number is just a number, I suppose, but. Things like uh, speed of light, you know, right? It's defined a cesium atom or something like that. Well, that was the second. That's the second, right? So, you know, you can do these sorts of things that you can present to aliens or, you know, yourself later on when you forgot what you've done and measure it because your past is an alien. Um, and, um, you know, reproduce it, right? So there's some odd things. Uh, there's also some very weird stuff with saying, this is going to be Planck's, Planck's constant. It's not going to go on forever. We're just going to stop it, and that's going to be better for measurement. It's, a little, it's really weird. It's really weird. But I, I found this absolutely amazing when this kind of erupted that, uh, you know, in the last 10 years. I actually saw someone give a talk about this, and I thought, this is going to be boring as anything, right? Like, so it's just going to be talking about measuring stuff. I mean, measuring stuff is very important, but it's just going to be talking about units. It's like, this is going to be so geeky and weird. But then I'm like, oh, no. You know, like, this is a disaster. Like, people don't have this sorted out. You're like, Come on. All right. OK. Other kinds of uh, scaling, right? There's very famous ones in turbulence. Lewis Fry Richardson, who we'll come back to in various ways. Um, you know, like to pull out these. Uh, it's, a, it's from Jonathan Swift's Big Fleas Have Little Fleas, right? Fractal, fractal concepts. Um, Richardson has a number named after him in, flu in, in fluids. He's, uh, you know, did, did some pretty great stuff, at least uh, thinking-wise there. And, and he had this idea that if you had enough people sitting down writing out differential equations and messing around with them, you could you know, perhaps start to predict the weather. And he sort of thought about you know, people's computers. He had this idea of it. But he, uh, he went off and did other things and looked at, say, the number of uh, you know, dire things, like number of deaths. Uh, the death toll is a function uh, for wars, right, ordered by size. So we'll 
kind of come back to some stuff that he looked at. So he had a whole treatise on uh, what he called fatal quarrels, which um, seems a little odd for terminology for a war, but he was meaning everything from like a double homicide out to the First World War. Anyway, all right, uh, efforts to understand everything. Uh, this is a funny piece. This is turbulence in, a, in a Van Gogh paintings, right? The claim is that, uh, that there was turbulence sitting in things like Starry Night and so on, and you don't see it in anyone else's uh, paintings. Uh, not observed or when, you know, when Van Gogh was uh, stable, right? So, <laughs> so it's a special person in a special case. All right, funny things to do. This is weird. This is, again, one of these people like Taylor. It's Karl Magarov, a very famous character. Just figured out, again, a dimensional analysis piece that uh, the energy in uh, um, wavelengths in, in the... Um, uh, in wavelengths in, in, uh, in a turbulent situation has to decay like this k to the minus 5 thirds or grow as, as uh, the wave number. Decay as the wave number grows as the wavelength. Uh, and there have been advances since then, and it seems to hold up, but turbulence is a very hard thing to understand. Fluid mechanics, as we've talked about, is a very successful field, but it gets very messy, of course, literally, uh, but you can't use the equations uh, in the same way. All right, that's, that's a long time ago. Uh, lots of things, of course, scaling. Uh, Mandelbrot very famously came up with this term, uh, fractals. Uh, and the geometry of nature was how he framed it, which was beautifully done. That is always a problem. This is not always well sorted out. Mathematicians still have pictures of these things from the kind of 80s sitting on their old websites uh, to try and lure people into their fields. Um, <laughs> kind of great. There's sort of the, the website thing. So if in computer science, you've got to have, you may have a white background, but ideally it's a gray background. It's like 1993, you know, just a list of things you've done. Um, <clears throat> Got to keep, yeah, uh, any attempt to go beyond that is just like, what are you doing? But I like that recently you see some people go to white, yeah. Mm. All right, Horton, this is 1945, uh, came up with this idea, for, uh, observed this scaling, these fractal scalings for uh, river networks, which then has, has been used uh, to describe out blood networks, for example, so it's branching networks in general. Uh, roughness of time series, this is just pointing out what kinds of scaling is rough, so for instance, in finance, you would talk about the Hurst exponent or just the roughness exponent, which is a measure of these. Um, so it's connected to the fractal story. Uh, Richardson, yes. Another thing he did was how long is Good question. How long is the coastline? Well, actually, maybe that was Mandelbrot. But good question. What, what, was the, what was the length of the coastline of England? Right? And it matters how you use your little tape measure. Right? If you've got a big tape measure or a big ruler, I should say, then you know, you're not going to get all the little nooks and crannies. And it turns, that was this sort of very strange observation that we started to, to get into in the 60s and 70s, that if you, it depends on the ruler you use. So fractals comes out of this. And then, uh, yeah, right, and then, then Mandelbrot, which the hilarious joke is that the B stands for Benoit B. Mandelbrot. Okay. Right. Um, fractal diet. Yeah, that's food, actually, right? Yeah, right. Okay. All right, so this is a good place to, to get into at the end. So uh, this will get to some of your residuals again, I think. So uh, this is uh, Louis Betancourt, who's done really super interesting things. It actually kind of builds out of that three-quarter stuff, which, as I said, doesn't really hold any water. But this has been a really interesting uh, body of work starting around uh, yeah, the middle of 2000 to 2007. So, Difficult thing, but you know, what's a city, right? But the idea is let's go to cities and measure these overall aspects of them and then see how they scale as a function of size. Density might matter, but they tend not to worry, uh, have much about density in there. Uh, there have been some elaborations on this that I'll try to include for Thursday. Uh, but there's a broad, so this, I think there are some things that go the other way, but there's a broad story that uh, certain things scale superlinearly, certain Thing scales subling it. So this is total wages as a function of population. And I showed you this plot early on. This is for the walking speed, so this is a terrible plot. This is a weird thing. They're using natural log, as far as I can tell, capital L in. Uh, but this scaling, right, this fit here is 1.12, right? So that's a bit, not much, but a bit faster than linear. So wages are kind of going up a little bit faster than linear. 
as the population goes up. That's total wages, right? Of course, then you divide it by the population. Uh, this is super creatives, which is you know, how these things are measured are a little bit funny. Sometimes it's patents, for example. Again, this exponent here is sort of the thing to point to. It's a bit greater than one. These are social phenomena, right? People coming together, creating things, you know, whatever it is. Uh, money is being created in strange ways. Money is very strange. Uh, so, lots of things. Get all the exponents out. Make a table. It's not a very good table, but um, here, here's, a, here's a three categories of things, roughly. So, there's sort of some breaks here and here. These pieces, like, so there's money, there's disease, crime, uh, actually total electric consumption, it's interesting, uh, wages and so on. These are inventors and patents, right? This is the super creative employment defined in some way. These exponents are all great, greater than one. So this is the claim of this paper, that these are all you know, significantly greater than one. Um, and right as a result, right, this is, you talk about these being social things, that there's some returns to scale that's super linear. Bigger and bigger cities produce things in really interesting ways. Yes? Yeah. But it seems to me that you'd always find some kind of scaling parameter if you plot things in this kind of way. Yeah. So, so I don't understand what the. Well, so this is the first paper in a, in a list, and it does what you're suggesting, which is just to try to describe. And so these ones are, this is the, this is the, I'll tell you what the claim is, and I'm not saying this is right, but the claim is that these are super linear. There are things here that are like total employment, housing, household water consumption they scale linearly, right? So there's an idea that these, these things aren't being changed by bigger cities being bigger or smaller. And then these pieces are sublinear. So the claim is then that these are like, supply, like roads, gasoline stations. These are like infrastructure supply things. So it sort of overall looks like a good thing mostly for cities, right? So the cities take maybe, although electric consumption scales proportionally, some things that you know are costly and problematic are sublinear. So that's good, right? That feels like a good thing. But crime is also superlinear, right? There are some pieces going in the wrong direction. Uh, this was the first paper. Um, so this is the claim, right? This is sort of the, the summary of that. So some problems. Density doesn't seem to matter. There's no density in that. That seems odd. And if you look at uh, across many cities, you get even two orders of magnitude variation in, in density. OK, this is, uh, right, OK, all the plot is here. So um, <laughs> this is pretty weird. So this is, uh, we're going to fit all those cities with those scaling laws and then look at the residuals, right? People have done this also with brain size, and it's called the encephalization quotient. And this is usually to make humans feel like they're really smart. Uh, so here's the idea. This is going to be, uh, uh, this is GMP, right? This is then the, the distribution of those residuals, which is fine. Um, this is looking at income and patents, and we're looking at the residuals. So in a sense, what you're saying is, let's take New York, let's take Burlington, and then effectively remove the, the, the population from them. Not just by dividing it by it, but by dividing by population to the power of whatever is the right fit, right? So we're going to take out this line of regression and look at these residuals. And so for income, you see, you know, this kind of, these, these ones are above, right? So Napa, I mean, it makes sense what you're seeing here. Um, you know, and places that aren't doing quite as well are, are further down here. This is McCullen, Texas. Burlington is actually, this is for patents. So Burlington is right up the top, actually, second in this list of 340. So it's punching above its weight, right, normalized. So this is a way of comparing cities of many, many different sizes, you know, how are they doing, right? There's, of course, you just want to compare to cities your size, fair enough, like this big, but this gives you a, a justified way of looking at that. So that's, you know, at least a descriptive use of, you know, residuals. And then, uh, you know, you want stories for why these things will start to kind of make sense. Cities are laid out very differently. You know, LA is just this big spread out pancake in terms of population. New York is incredibly dense in the middle and then really becomes quite sparse as you go further out. It becomes much sparser more quickly than, say, LA does. 
So in terms of theory, and this is where we'll end, and this to me, there's a limit to how much one can kind of go into. Um, uh, okay, so we, we got to this point here <coughs> in this whole thing about scaling, and there are other pieces, as you can see, well, money and language, really fun, interesting things, and I'll, I'll come back to them in, in later lectures. But I think the idea of scaling is out there, so you, you've already done your assignment, so we're going onwards. All right, so this was this piece from Betancourt, right, that and, and colleagues, and that started a whole um, body of work, much of it from them, but, but many other people have sort of come along on scaling of um, human population aspects with city sizes. And this was this odd thing, how do you measure city size? You would think it's kind of easy, but you have to, you have to sort of work with some of the data that uh, is available, right? It's sometimes it's uh, uh, like a political boundary and so on, but you kind of want what is the blob of the city? What's the functioning city uh, size? All right, so they've worked hard on that sort of thing. We looked at these kinds of scalings, and there was this general story claim, right? This is the first work on this. This claim that uh, uh, social kinds of things tend to have a superlinear scaling uh, Infrastructure type things have a sublinear scaling. So there's this return to scale, right? There's this nice feature that bigger cities require less of certain things relatively. Uh, and they produce some good things, although there's disease and crime seems to go up as well. So this was the story, and what I wanted to add just here is that there have been there's been some work to show that not all social things go that way. All right, so this is this general story. Um, I don't know why that weird little thing is in there. Anyway, so um, this, fine, this is all good. This was the residual piece, which is very important, and you can, we'll come back to that in various ways. Right, and we got a nice shout out for ourselves here. Burlington for patents is punching above its weight when its weight is uh, completely renormalized. This is a uh, piece that, if you're interested, it's a theoretical piece, right? Lots of um, uh, attempts to sort of exp uh, you know, work through a, a, an actual model-based story of how people interact and move around giving rise to this superlinear scaling. Sixology, right? So it's one plus a six, one, and one minus a six. So five, six, one, and seven, six are these apparently uh, special scaling exponents. Maybe, maybe. All right, this is the piece I wanted to add. Uh, I guess I have a couple slides for it, but it's mail or at L from a, just a few years ago now. And so superlinear scaling, as I said, for crime and disease, all these things, the social phenomena. But it turns out that uh, that's not entirely true. So they looked at a couple of um, death stati statistics, so homicide, traffic, and suicide. Um, they're complicated things, right? The, you know, this is a famous suicide is, um, <coughs> I think I have it here, right? This is a famous, uh, yeah, it's Durkheim, right? I mean, this is a very famous studies and, and thinking about these sorts of things. Going back a long time, hard to, hard to work with. Um, yeah, we do have work here. We're trying to get to things like depression and suicide through social media, trying to help people through that. So if that's something you're interested in, that's a story lab, um, story lab work. Um, and okay, so it turns out that homicide seems to have this superlinear scaling, so which isn't like a great thing, right? But that seems to be there. Traffic does not. Seems, seems to be independent of city size. I'm sure Boston is an outlier, but this is this is uh, seems to scale like this. This is for Brazil. This is all data for Brazil. And suicide actually appears to go sublinearly, right? So this would be would seem to be a good story that the social, um, you know, having people around you, which is Durkheim's story, really, uh, is is actually beneficial. So, so more nuanced, right? But it's still you could you could still say there's a um, this, this this is sensible. Of course, you can have a story for everything. They did some nice stuff, and I'll just sort of point to this, uh, trying to look at, uh, so these are the trying to fit things in various ways. You see it's pretty messy, so you've had to do some sneaky stuff to make this work out. Uh, this is looking at the residuals, right? So this is, as population gets kind of a residual, right? You're taking out the trend, so the relative fraction is going down. Per population, it's normalized, that's what it is. So you can see the, right, per population for traffic's pretty flat, homicide goes up, maybe. Yeah, and th this is all still, I mean, the data's there, but it's all still rough work, I suppose. Uh, this is to say, over time, things haven't really changed. These are these exponents. They haven't changed enormously, so you could look at this. This is a, this is just, I'm putting this up here because it's an interesting thing to do. Look at temporal changes. You know, maybe there's a story here, but, you know, it could be just 
I mean, the Arabas would suggest there is, but that's not always how these things work. Um, and they did some work for the U.S. as well and found the suicide uh, data scaled in the same way. All right, one more couple of pieces. All right, so that's an it. I just wanted to add that to sort of, um, you know, there's this big idea of the social and, the so, you know, how social stuff seems to scale superlinearly, but it's not always the case. So this is a super interesting thing. We'll come back to this later on. Uh, this is to do with how uh, many, many kinds of complex systems are distributed, and it seems to be like maybe broken into small pieces, right? We have things that we've forced, you know, maybe states and counties and so on, and but we have other things like where we've put out, where Starbucks gets put. Okay, just one second. And then where hospitals are, where schools are, how do you allocate those things based on the population? So that's a, right, and different motivations, yes. Yeah, so linear scaling, right? If you've got y as a function of x, it's, it's, it's scaling is x to the power of 1. Superlinear is x to the power of alpha, where alpha is greater than 1. Yeah. And sublinear is, that's it. Yeah, I understand that, but what's, what's the meaning of it? Well, so, sup so superlinear means that it's taking off, right? It's, it's growing faster than the population. So there's a, right, you're getting, you, so if you double the population, you more than double the crime or, or wealth or these other social things. But you less than double the um, suicide um, rate. Yeah, so it's a return to scale. So things that scale linearly, you know, bigger cities, you know, it's just like a smaller city, right? But if you want, if you if you increase the population, then these other things change in, in ways that are. And, and so there's debates about you know the actual exponents and all those things, but it does seem to be there's there is super linear scaling, right? It's not, you know, to the power of two. It's not insane, you know, it's not out of control, but it's it's above one. Right, I mean, you think you look at these things. You think, well, why would anyone want to not live in a huge city or something, right? So, so it starts to sort of because it's not measuring everything, obviously, right? And you you need people sort of. I mean, uh, well, do you need? Yeah, I think we do need people living in all sorts of scales and places. This is a different thing now, right? So this is population density. So you're going to have to look. So we go to New York City; it's very dense, and then you move out to the country. You know, it's low and so on. So you're measuring density in some way, but you're putting you know areas around. Uh, and then we're going to look at the density of some facility. And in this case, on the left, it's hosp ambulatory hospitals in the U.S. and then public schools in the U.S. And so there are two different densities, population density and then density of things that are servicing that population. This is, again, a superlinear scaling, right? So they, they, they're more dense. The population doubles. You get more hospitals than you would expect from a linear point of view. But uh, schools actually, uh, this is more like two-thirds. It's more like a two-thirds scaling, right? So you double the population, you don't double the density, or the pop you double the population density, I should say, but you don't double the population, the density of, say, schools. And so this is from uh, a work that followed on from really many, many, many decades, many people, like geographers, mathematicians, lots of different people thinking about this problem, computer scientists thinking about it as well, how do you allocate uh, facilities, whatever the problem is. And this seems to be a pro-social kind of thing. This is, this is a result of you wanting to make the average distance that any, or time that anyone needs to travel to this lo these locations to be small, right? So this is good for public schools. Uh, if you're trying to make money, then it's more like a linear, a linear scaling. You, you, you don't care so much about the less dense places. So we'll get into that later on, but it connects also to forest fires and how you would try to put in forest breaks Right, how you allocate things and why we end up with heterogeneous structures. And I think the big story is we're trying, many systems are trying to minimize risk in some way. Risk is sort of the piece here. So that is something we're actually, through this course, we've been kind of building this story. And Dewhurst, who's your, um, David Dewhurst, who's your, uh, the assistant, though the TA in this course, is, uh, this is going to be a, I think, a fantastic piece of work from him. All right, I just wanted to finish. Uh, the, the people piece in here, and I think that's it, yep. Uh, this is uh, about, so this is from Neil Johnson, who's a friend of ours, he's now at um, George Washington, I believe, right? And this is looking at, we'll come back to this later on when we look at uh, learning rates for how you do things, right? So there's old studies of building planes, for example, or Moore's law fits into this as well, right? So how we get better at making stuff with time. 
And so that seems to apply to, uh, in this case, terrorist attacks, right? So this is the gap between distinct events. Uh, these are um, fatal attacks. Often, uh, early on, this work was about IEDs in um, Afghanistan and Iraq. And so they, they tend to compress, right? Because, uh, in a sense, people are getting better at building these things. Uh, but it's a, uh, and you can see, this is actually comparing many, many different places to look at this scaling. And um, Neil's work eventually led to s s sort of this kind of ecology of war idea. And so you could see, you know, whether a, a civil war perhaps was changing from something or an asymmetric war, I guess, uh, was changing from something where you know the, the 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 blue was dominating the red, or the other way around, right? Depending on how you want to frame things. Okay, so <coughs> scaling in there as well. Uh, it's a it's a funny kind of scaling, but this is yeah the number of events here and the time between them has this um, negative scaling, and that exponent uh, gives you a measure of like how things how fast are things uh, accelerating, right? Okay, so it's just a little bit more about people. It's just a touch of what's possible in all of this. Um, you know, I'm giving you a survey and I'm trying to sort of impart that these things are everywhere. And it's, it's often for systems we talk about, uh, the, the main thing to start with, right, is to think about, uh, you know, how these, how, how these systems you know, change over, over many orders of magnitude. Cryptographs. All right. Different things. I'm just going to show you a little bit more about scaling here. We were talking about language before, so I thought I might, might go through this. Uh, this is about the regularization of English. So English, famously, lots of invasions and uh, general silliness of English people. We have a very strange language, right, with lots of... Uh, so the French came in for a while and, and added all sorts of things uh, and on top of this Germanic background, but it's a mixture. And then it's become, a, you know, with the whole colonization of the world thing and that's retreated, uh, there was absorbing of all sorts of other words. So English is a bit of an odd one. So this is an explanation of looking at the past tense of verbs in English. That's what it is, right? So uh, <coughs> that is, generally speaking, uh, and, and conjugation in general, but past tense is, is a pretty interesting one. So ED is the rule, is the winning rule, right? You can imagine this as an algorithmic thing, right? Which, where it's an information sharing thing. We have an algorithm for communicating with each other. And we cleaned up the, well, collectively, we may have cleaned up the code, which I, it's not entirely a, a, a great thing. But, okay, so this is the number of irregular verbs and the frequency of usage, right? So this is what we were talking about before with, um, these are the most common words out here. So to be and to have are the most common verbs in English. They are weird, right? I am, you are, they're just strange things, and this is typical of many languages. I think it's kind of a theory of mind thing, right? English, uh, we're developing the words, and my amnes is different to your anus, but we both jump. Like, that. that's true, right? Uh, anyway, so as you go back, you see that there's this sort of spread. So modern English has less of these irregular verbs uh, when we go down to lower frequencies, and they're just less in general here. But Old English to Middle English to uh, Modern English, there's been this uh, decay in the number of irregular verbs. And you can, s there's, you know, we don't have to go into all this, but this uh, an effort to kind of estimate how rapidly that's happening. And it seems to be a scaling law, so that's why this is in these slides, uh, that the rate of regularization uh, decays as uh, frequency to the minus a half. So I, d I don't think there's any rule for, you know, any explanation for why this might be. Uh, there are all sorts of other kind of scalings floating around about language that may or may not be, you know, that aren't very well understood. Uh, but this is, uh, so, so, all right, so it's further out, so it's going to take longer. You know, maybe one day we'll say I am and you am and we am. And there are estimates of how long that will take based on this, right? So the more common verb, the more resilient it is to change, which makes sense, right? And we have this, and the new ones we introduced, Google, right? I Google, you Google, we Google, they Google, like we, and we Googled. Uh, that, that comes in as it just gets the regular uh, conjugation. Uh, this is a, a sense of what's happened over the years. So these are, so as I said, to be and to have, have not regularized, so they get a 0%, and there's an estimate of how long, 40,000 years of, of uh, humans talking in English, then they will uh, end up with 
uh, very simple conjugation. So uh, these are these are um, ones that aren't that you know they the ones in black. If you can see that, hopefully they haven't become regularized, um, but the uh, red ones have. So you know, so you know, teach and taught, for example. Little kids will want to say teach, right? They want to say that, and we are incredibly upset about it. You know, it's very fundamental. It's like obviously wrong. But um, it's sort of a form of child abuse where we, you know, where we say, you know, this is, this is you, you, you don't know what you're saying, right? You can't speak like that. So uh, that's an that's a interesting, interesting piece. All right. Oh, yeah, that's true. So what, we're, about to, we're down to about 150 irregular verbs for past tense. And wed is kind of on the bubble, right? So two people were wed, but you could be wedded to an idea. Like this sort of, we were wedded to this idea. That, so that usage of the word wed... Uh, gets a gets the the normal past tense. So it's been winning, but some things are just fun to say. So snuck is fun to say. So that's been kind of doing well. People say snuck um, and sneaked, but snuck is doing well for itself. So there is also word feel. Uh, things like plurals, right? So we there are different kinds of regularized. So s is become ending in s is the is the winning kind of rule for English, and you know, we still say children which is a German or you know, Linux boxen, if we talk about computers. But uh, children, but if you say you know, the, the, the childs, then that, that's going to, it just hurts, right? It's very odd. All right. Um, OK, that's good. Lots of other interesting scalings in, in language that I can talk about later. But that's just a little piece there. OK. Mm -hmm. No. Um, so I'm just going to plug in one piece here, and we'll come back to some more of it later as well. Scaling is such a, as I've tried to present, you know, such an absolutely gigantic piece of thinking about large systems uh, you know, where, they, where there is variation of scale and there is potentially this sort of um, <coughs> similarity across scales if you do the right thing. Uh, that's not to say everything is like that, but it's a, it is a huge, huge part of systems. So this is Moore's Law, so extremely famous, and I'm just going to give you this really nice connection that's been made between a number of pieces. Um, and I think the initial paper was like doubling every two years maybe, and then it was reframed by Moore, who's still around and, and funds data science initiative, initiatives, uh, to a, every 18 months. It's done in different ways. So this is uh, counts, right? This is... Um, a count thing. So this is a, a, that's where we get our doubling. So transistor count doubling every two years per unit area sort of idea. It can be reframed in different ways. So that's Moore's Law, very, very famous thing. And let me add one piece for Moore's Law, which is here. So this is, go away, this is a, a wired uh, article from a few years ago. It's 2013. Um, <laughs> See, it's hard to read this. It says 4, 17, 13. Fine. You should always put year, four, four numbers, then the month, then the day. Everyone can get that. So, right, an interesting thing is it, it, it was just an observation, then it became a self fulfilling prophecy of sorts, right? It was like, we have to make it happen, and people invented all sorts of things that weren't in the same category as what came before. And uh, so this goes on and on. But, so I guess it's mostly writing. But the point about this is that the Pixar maniacs wanted to make these films, and it's maybe, there you go, late 70s, when they started talking, someone started thinking about it, part of this, what would become the team, and they used Moore's Law to figure out when they'd be able to do what they wanted to do. And they were, you know, and it, it was good. It was like 15, uh, 20, you know, 20, it's gonna take 20 years ago to, to take, right? We got close to making it in the mid 80s, but they knew essentially from Moore's Law that this would not be possible. And they held on to it and, you know, it became an incredible uh, success. So that's a really uh, kind of interesting, you know, from a social, technological kind of uh, viewpoint, that's a pretty interesting um, projection into the future that worked really well. Very famous paper um, <coughs> that's connected to this. This is, uh, uh, gives rise to this rights law. It's called rights law. And it's about the, I mean, this is really, wow, this is kind of an amazing thing. So this is, right, the this is a long time ago, right? So the, it's the 1930s when it was published. The present writer, you know, this sort of stuff. We're very much into the active now. Is that what you, like we? It's like we did this, you know, like we're owning it and so on, instead of this kind of you know people in white suits thing. 
Um, the president right, right, so has been working on this since 1922. And one of the things uh, this, this guy was interested in was production, right? Uh, and so this was looking at how long it would take to make a plane by some group. Um, I don't know what the corporation was. So there are a mixture of things in here. This is the cost of the last machine of a series, right? So the cost is going down because you're getting better at making it. You're getting better at sourcing things. You're maybe not having to make every special part. First of all, you're trying to make something that, in this case, flies and doesn't fall out of the sky. So there's a lot of like, you know, just invention going on here. And then you become better and better at it. Uh, this is the labor production cost. This is different things being shown here, but this idea that they're, they're also going down. So looking at a whole bunch of pieces here, uh, and I'll, I have the framing for rights law properly, but this is, I, I think I showed this as a number in series, one, two, three, four, it's just, you know, lined up in, this is a rank ordered thing. I did, I did mention this in scaling, there's uh, related work for this, or inspired by this, was uh, looking at the, um, the, the time between terrorist attacks, right, and it was the same thing, you have terrorists who are getting better at um, you know, inventing whatever it is in that case was IEDs, right? So um, improvised explosive devices, and it tracks in the same way. And you can look at how that's traveling to see if, you know, if you're on the blue team versus red team, like where, where things are going. So this is to put these pieces together, Wright's Law. Um, Moore's Law, I'm sure you've heard of. Wright's Law, maybe not, but they are famous things. So this is about learning and making and production and invention. And, you know, even with Moore's Law, you could talk about this space that was going to be um, accessed eventually, but not know the technology, right? Not know the, it's not just like, we will make smaller versions of the thing we have, we'll actually discover new um, you know, ways of, of creating transistors. So let's put things together here. This is a paper from a few years ago, Nagy, who was at Santa Fe Institute, I think at MIT now. Uh, so we've got the, uh, the unit cost for the stuff, right? So YT, so this is something that we, think is going down, this is how much is being made. So rights law can be expressed in this way, that the amount of stuff being made is actually proportional, time is in here, but it's more stuff you make, um, uh, the, the, the cost is going down and you're making more stuff. It's an inverse power law here, right? So more and more widgets you're producing and, and the per unit cost is going down. So that sort of makes sense in general, but actually, you know, to see that it has some scaling is, is an extra layer here, right? You know, you double the number you produce. And in, ha in achieving that, you've had to, you know, do some clever things to make it possible and so on. And you just didn't, you didn't, it's not just, there is a return to that. So then Moore's law can be um, framed in different ways. And one is that the amount of stuff decreases exponentially, sorry, the uh, cost goes down exponentially with time. So now time is um, ex explicit there. And there's a connecting one. So this is sometimes called Sahal's law but it connects both of them. And it's that the, uh, <coughs> the, the volume of stuff is also going up exponentially, right? So these, there's an exponential aspect here and you can see how we can combine these two pieces to, together to get this inverse power law. So of course, this is for things that are taking off that people you know, are using. So we, if we put those together, we have the connection between these various uh, factors. And so this uh, Nagy paper has a number of, what is it, about 60, I think 60 products. And I mean, they're quite different. This is memory, DRAM, this is PVC, um, and magnesium, right? This is completely different sorts of things. We're making this, you know, getting this out of the earth. This is another thing we're making. Um, and they all, you know, these are rough. These are very squished little graphs, but uh, this is the price going down. This is an exponential graph here, right? So linear on this scale, this is exponential logarithmic scale, so this looks linear on this. This is the amount um, being shipped, right? So that has this kind of exponential growth. Obviously, it's going to be somewhat rough. Uh, PVC, similar thing, similar thing, similar thing. So that, that's much rougher up there. You could imagine this is from you know, discovery of different places. I don't know the details of magnesium. Maybe we have a magnesium champion here who can tell us about it. But um, so very different places. And then you can start to put them all together. And this is you know, you're getting these different measures out. <clears throat> this is from Sahal's law, and then these are, these are coming from, um, <clears throat> well, maybe I've got that wrong, but Wright, Wright's law and so on. 
Oh, the right parameter is this one. Yep. Right. And then this is Sahal and Moore's law put together. Uh, but they, they, this idea that they, you know, they, they match up quite well, right? So, um, but slightly different things. So these are chemical pieces up here, maybe hardware. So this is things like Moore's law and energy and other. Uh, anyway, so that's, you know, if a, if a whole sector seems to be developing well, there's a, so all of this is to say that Moore's law is kind of everywhere. Right? It's all over the place. You might want to think about it in social phenomena, just as I mentioned for terrorists, but you can think about organizations. I don't know what it means for people using Snapchat or something. Do they get faster? <laughs> um, <clears throat> but you can think, I'm sure you can think of it yourself, stuff that you've mastered over time. The first time you've done something, it was really a struggle, and then you get better at it, and you get better at it, and you get better at it, right? And there was this exponential or scaling so sorts of structures in there. So Moore's law is everywhere, and then also this Wright's law, which is this this shrinking of time between doing, think, producing something. You get better at making it, it gets faster and faster. Yep. So that's a, a package that I want to put in there. I think it's a beautiful thing. Uh, now I guess we're getting maybe to the end of Moore's Law. We, we like to say that over and over, but there is, a, there is a point, right? Things get too small eventually, and we understand this quantum business. So um, I guess we, we've, we've kind of gotten around with that a little bit by just Putting computers everywhere now, so we've we seem to be happy about it. All right. <clears throat>